loud. <laughs> okay, so we're, I just want to let everybody know that we will be live streaming this event and also recording it. So we're going to get a go-ahead signal from, from our videographers. So Jay? Okay. So we are live. Welcome to the fourth UC Day to Day, sponsored by UC Libraries and IT at UC. It gives me great pleasure that you're all here for the day and also to introduce our Dean of Libraries, Shimo Wong, and he's going to introduce our keynote speakers. Thank you, Amy, and good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Shima Wang, Dean of the UC Libraries. Um, this is our fourth, the fourth annual Data Day. The theme of the, this year Data Day is diversity, equity, and inclusion in data. The topic was chosen due to its relevance in the light of current event in the United States and around the world today. The role of the data, its connection, preservation, someone called curation, dissemination, and accessibility has moved to the front, the forefront of the public's consciousness. It is important for us to consider our practice and professional responsibility and to work towards addressing the challenges we encounter. This topic is meant to be proactive and to challenge us today. I'm very pleased I have the schedule some time and spending with the time with the audience here today with this great event. Over the past years, UC Library has made a great strength in advancing and expanding our commitment to the research and the data management. This includes a newly created special unit called the Research Data Service, or RDS. This is a truly interdisciplinary unit we create in the library. The team expertise range across disciplines such as library and information science, knowledge management, health informatics, medical science, and geo and GIS, geography and GIS expertise. RDS will support the library's mission and the vision through the development and implementation of interdisciplinary research data service and management that enable research and promote synergetic collaborations among the UC, all colleges and the units. Today, you will meet some of them in the audience today. I encourage you to ask them whether you're working for the RDS and what the RDS is about. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the UC Office of Research, IT at the UC, and the National Network of Libraries for the Medicine for the Greater Middle West Region, known as NNARMGMR, for their sponsorship and support for the Data Day. A special thanks to a great committee that are working together, put today's event together. Data Day committee, including Tiffany Grant, Amy Koshoffer, Amy Natasi, Jane Combs, Lori Harris, Ted Baldwin, Don Jason, Rebecca Olsen, Richard Johnson, and Mark Commers. Thank you all for all of your hard work. Please join me. Thank the committee. <laughs> Thanks go to our today's keynote speaker and the panelist, which you, they will be introduced later. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dr. Bruset Marshall, who will be introduce one of our keynote speaker this morning. Dr. Marshall is UC's Vice President for the Equity, Inclusion, Community Impact. Blue has been great partner and support to the UC Library. Thank you very much. Please welcome Dr. Marshall. Thank you so much, Ding Wang. Good morning, everyone. 
Well, I bring you greetings on behalf of President Neville Pinto and our Board of Trustees. Again, we'd like to welcome you to the fourth annual Day to Day today. You know, clearly I recognize the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our society. And I'm elated that UC Libraries has chosen to connect this topic today in such an impactful and meaningful way. So I want to extend a special thank you to our visionaries and the event organizers for today, and also for our participants, our consumers of the knowledge that will be shared with you today. Um, as you may know, data are some of the most powerful tools that we currently have at our disposal. Data not only help us to stay informed and engaged, but they also help us to make connections and lead to insights and improvements. Data drive sound decisions, enhance equitable measures and best practices for our families, our communities, and the world at large. And so today I'm equally excited and delighted by the range of topics that will be shared, as well as the expertise of the presenters for today's program. I have the privilege and the honor of introducing our first keynote speaker, and although very modest and asking me to keep it short to two sentences, a woman after my own heart, I'm going to veer just a little bit to tell you about her expertise. So our first keynote speaker of the day is Ms. Amanda Wilson. She brings a breadth and depth of knowledge in relation to the public's access to data and how to best use that data to improve their individual and collective lives. In 2017, Ms. Wilson was appointed head of the National Network Coordination Office of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine for the National Library of Medicine. In her role, Ms. Wilson works to ensure equal access to biomedical information for U.S. health professionals, and she works to improve the public's access to information, information, thereby enabling them to make informed decisions about their health and their health care. During her tenure at the National Network Coordinating Office, Ms. Wilson established the All of Us Research Program through a new partnership between NLM and NIH. The purpose of this partnership is to improve consumer access to high quality health information in communities throughout the U.S. Ms. Wilson will share more about that uh, program and partnership during her address this morning. Ms. Wilson brings considerable experience in leading change in large organizations and collaborating across organizations to produce positive results for users. She joins NLM from the U.S. Department of Transportation where she was the director of National Transportation Library, of the National Transportation Library, and the assistant director, Office of Transportation Information Resources for the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. In these roles, Ms. Wilson was instrumental in leading the operations and expansion of the National Transportation Library and the establishment of the National Transportation Knowledge Network. Since 2015, she has chaired SENDI an interagency federal scientific and technical information managers group. I hear you over there, but we're gonna keep it going just a little bit. <laughs> Ms. Wilson's professional experience and service include assistant professor and metadata librarian at the Ohio State University Libraries, adjunct professor in the Department of Library and Information Science at the Catholic University of America, CUA Department of Library and Information Science Board, and the ALA Committee on Accreditation External Review Panels. Ms. Wilson has an MS in Library Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a BA in Music and Psychology from Emory University. Please join me in not only welcoming Ms. Amanda Williams to the University of Cincinnati, but welcoming her to the podium as our first keynote speaker. Good morning, everyone. All right, thank you. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. I'm really excited to be able to share with you some information about the NIH's All of Us Research Program, as well as the partnership that the National Library of Medicine has with all of us. 
I um, also want to thank uh, the planners for what appears to be an amazing event, and I really look forward to the interesting conversations uh, that will happen today. So a brief disclaimer, I do not work for the All of Us Research Program, though I play one on TV. And so um, we do have the honor of partnering with them. So a lot of the questions and discussion that we're having, note, I will be asking for some of your input and um, your ideas as for several areas throughout the talk this morning. So um, some of those things I might be able to answer, others I will take back with me. So I do want to say one, I hope you're ready to continue to be in engaged, and, um, and two, don't ask too many hard questions. So, okay. Thank you very much. So I'd like you to imagine that for a moment. We live in a future where, where illness can be prevented and the burden of disease is minimized. Imagine a world where everyone participates in the development of new discoveries and therapies, and most importantly, everyone benefits. That's precisely what the All of Us Research Program hopes to achieve. And the theme of today's um, day to day, I think, resonates with a lot of what that uh, sort of future vision that All of Us hopes to help bring about. So I mentioned earlier that I'm going to stop a few times throughout the talk to hear your questions and get your thoughts on some of the challenges that the program is facing. But before we jump in, I want to give a big thank you to my colleagues at the All of Us Research Program. Bless you. Um, we have Dr. Dara Richardson Heron, who is the Chief Engagement Officer for the program. And on your right, you have Dr. Kate Blazinski, who is the Policy Director for the All of Us Research Program. So they help me make sure I'm giving you the most um, up to date and um, important information about the program here today. Oh. Also, any questions? Kate is another amazing colleague. She has said that anything I can't answer to send everyone here to her. So please do a quick Google search for Kate Blazinski, our policy director for All of Us Research Program. She really loves engaging uh, with researchers around the program and some of these issues that we're talking about. So you heard me mention both Dara and Kate uh, throughout the, the presentation today. I'll come back to this later, but this is how you can connect directly with the All of Us Research Program for any other questions um, or thoughts. So to talk about the All of Us Research Program, you have to talk about the Precision Medicine Initiative. So let's start there. Precision medicine at its core is a democratic endeavor. It's about tailoring medical treatments to the needs of an individual and their specific situation, whoever and wherever they are. It's the right treatment for the right person at the right time. So some examples of precision medicine or a, um, an individualized approach are things like eyeglasses or blood transfusions. So precision medicine is already with us in these instances where we em embrace a one-size-does-not-fit-all approach. It doesn't represent, however, the full range of clinical care. And I think we can all agree that there are plenty of areas in the medical space where treatment is still limited in its ability to target the specific contextual needs of each patient. And there's a risk to continuing to operate in sort of one size fits all approach. Not only are there measurable costs to the patient in the sense of potentially needless suffering, there are both human and financial costs to the clinical system, further compounding the problems at the patient level, as well as impediments to improvement in the science that forms a foundation for medical treatments. Patients are suffering, providers don't have the time and resources to provide precision care, and even if they did, research is fractioned to the point where the community cannot, without a paradigm shift, hope to develop the knowledge base necessary to direct changes in healthcare strategies. So in 2015, the Obama administration announced the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is a multi-agency directive to usher in a new era of precision medicine for everyone. It incorporates activities from multiple departments in the US federal government, from the Department of Defense, to Energy, to the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, to several areas in the Department of Health and Human Services, including NIH. The Precision Medicine Initiative, or PMI, was established with the mission to enable a new era of medicine through research, technologies, and policies that empower patients, researchers, and providers to work together toward the development of individualized care. 
To guide these efforts, the White House commissioned a task force to craft sets of principles to shape the initiative's privacy and security safeguards, as well as its ideological framework. These are the PMI privacy and trust principles and the PMI data security policy principles and framework. You can find these on the All of Us website. In 2016, Congress passed the 21st Century Cures Act with broad bipartisan support. Uh, this act codified PMI into law and authorized $1.45 billion in funding for the Precision Medicine Initiative over 10 years. In addition, it includes a number of initiatives and provisions that help to sculpt the PMI, including pervasive language on health disparities and diversity, provisions on data sharing, and really importantly, language about data privacy. While it's very much a cross-government initiative, the All of Us Research Program is the cornerstone of the Precision Medicine Initiative. As such, the National Institutes of Health has a bulk of the Precision Medicine Initiative in its hands. So what exactly is the All of Us Research Program? It is a game-changing effort to collect data longitudinally from one million or more participants that, rep that represent and reflect the diversity of those living and working in the United States. When the program reaches its goal, it will ostensibly be the largest and most diverse cohort in the nation Researchers will be able to use information collected to identify steps that we can all take to stay healthy longer and to find health conditions early, often when they are most treatable. And to also better understand why different people respond differently to various medications and treatments, and also to help develop more effective, personalized, and precise treatments based on us as unique individuals. The program melds together two facets of the next generation of scientific research, cohort programs, and research consortia. It brings together clinicians, geneticists, social and behavioral scientists, and others, all experts in their fields, to create a rich longitudinal resource that serves scientific advancement. More than just unprecedented in size, the program endeavors to create a truly diverse resource and a resource whose data serves the diversity of research objectives. So they hope that the data will be available to a broad range of researchers, from high school students, to community scientists, to seasoned scientists at premier research institutions around the world. So the mission is simple and bold, to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. The program aims to create a new model of research based on collaboration among researchers, providers, community and provider organizations, and participants. This requires nurturing those relationships. Again, that building that hugely valuable resource as a repository of data that will be access accessible in unprecedented ways. And finally, the program will do what it takes to catalyze a robust ecosystem of researchers and funders who are hungry to use the data set. This slide includes the core values that guide the program's commitment to doing things differently, to doing them better. I'll touch on all of them except for the first and the last two in more detail, so I really wanna highlight those now. One, that participation is open to all living and working in the United States, and seven and eight, security and privacy are of the highest importance and finally, that the program will be a catalyst for change in research. The program's commitment to these values has guided its efforts and transformational approaches and policies that will achieve broad and diverse participation. So what is transformational diversity in the context of all of us? It's building a database of those one million or more individuals. It's also targeting that 75% of those one million individuals, one million or more, um, come from uh, groups that are historically underrepresented in biomedical research. Are we coming back to that theme, underrepresented in biomedical research or UBR populations throughout this talk? 
So of those 75% of 1 million who are from UBR populations, the program also targets that 50% of those will be of racial and ethnic minorities. So this requires creativity and innovation to reach all of these different populations. That's why the program is taking this transformational approach with quadruple diversity represented on this slide. The diversity of people, geography, health status, and data types. We're, commu we're committed to ensuring that all communities, especially those UBR populations, have the opportunity to both benefit and participate in this initiative. The program is working with grassroots community groups across the U.S. as trusted advisors and ambassadors to help achieve its goals. Um, components of the strategy are developing a national network of healthcare provider organizations who have incentives and methods to reach diverse people and places. Creating an innovative network of direct volunteer partners who can reach 90% of the U.S. population um, where they live, within 20 to 45 minutes of where they live. To also build a network of local and community partners to help build lifelong, trusted relationships with key communities across the country. And to drive programs that ease the way for diverse communities to participate in the program. The approach to diversity feeds directly into all of us's transformational approach to participation. The one million or more volunteers in the program will be true partners in the research process. The program will empower participants by providing access to the information gathered over the course of the program so that participants can use this information to learn more about their own health. We know that's important. The program's participant partners will be involved in program development, including what data is collected, what lab analyses are done, what research is conducted, and how data gets responsibly returned to participants. And of course, participants can choose to stop and re-enroll at any time during the program. As participants are the heart and soul of the All of Us Research Program, they will have a chance to learn about their own health, including genetic information, personalized risk factors, and exposures. It's the hope of the program that um, being a part of all of us will enable them to access their own increasingly rich health records. And discuss in more detail, it will provide the opportunity for communities that have historically not benefited from research to now be included in studies that may lead to new understanding and new scientific discoveries that come about as a result of the program. For researchers, longitudinal data is the dream data set. This database will be diverse with data including biospecimens, uh, blood and urine, along with health records, electronic health records. The program is building an infrastructure to allow access to both the raw data, cleaned and curated data, which will all be uh, kept in a secure environment. The infrastructure will enable researchers to collaborate with participants and other researchers to accelerate breakthroughs and leverage innovation. Most importantly, it will allow researchers to focus on doing the actual research as opposed to building the infrastructure. What you see on the right side of the screen is a snapshot of the researcher workbench that is currently in development for the program. Um, right now, we're collecting, evaluating, and curating some initial data sets with anticipated availability of this researcher workbench in 2019. For healthcare providers, the knowledge gained from all of us will allow for more effective, precise care. Research conducted using all of us data may also help us better understand the impact of environmental and lifestyle factors on our health. We'll have a deeper understanding of this information for diverse populations as well. This new knowledge will allow for enhanced prevention, earlier detection, and ultimately more efficient healthcare and more impactful research. Touching briefly on privacy and security, you'll remember that's the seventh core value of the program. It's, um, the All of Us approach is comprehensive and has been a top priority of the program since its inception. The most important responsibility of the All of Us research program is to safeguard participants' identity and their data. Uh, from the beginning, the program has implemented privacy and security principles to help ensure participant data is safe 
as it can be made. Um, our security experts are taking additional steps to protect participant security, including intent and encryption, intrusion tests, and other tools that can contribute to enhance security and decrease vulnerabilities. While it's impossible to guarantee that data within all of us will never be compromised, the program can say without equivocation that we're doing everything we can to protect the privacy and security of our data. You remember they're also driven by those PMI uh, trust principles as well as data access frameworks. So those were the values and principles upon which the program is based. I'd like to turn now to sort of more concrete operational building blocks of the program and so that help you understand how one can enroll. Uh, the consortium partners on this slide serve very different, func uh, different functions for the program, from storing and distributing data and participant samples, to building the website and mobile apps for the program, to interacting with participants and prospective participants during the enrollment process and beyond. Specifically, the key components are starting at the top left. Um, there's a data and research center at Vanderbilt where all the data lives in a secure environment. The Biobank from Mayo Clinic is a repository for processing, storing, and sharing biosamples. The Participant Center on the top right runs the direct volunteer portion of the program. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The Participate Technology Systems Center runs the website and the mobile app that's uh, Vibrant Health. Healthcare provider organizations and their network um, compri are comprised of regional medical centers, federally qualified health centers, and the Veteran Affairs Department. They help facilitate enrollment through their current members. And later, they'll be able to enroll people who are outside of their uh, membership. And finally, we have the communications and engagement component, which support all the marketing and design work, um, including coordination with our community engagement partners. So this slide is right now um, representing um, many of the brands, people, and organizations across the U.S. who the, organi who the All of Us program um, has engaged to help enroll and retain participants. These organizations, institutions, and companies um, comprise the All of Us Consortium. You might hear me say that later. What I mean is everyone here. In addition to everyone here, uh, there are a group of uh, uh, community engagement partners. That's where the National Library of Medicine falls in. So we work closely with the consortium um, to help them accomplish their um, enrollment, engagement, and retention. There are two ways that people can um, enroll in the program. You heard me talk about direct volunteers and healthcare provider organizations. So those are the two paths. So if you're a member of one of the healthcare provider organizations, you can join when you go in for your regular visit if you so choose. Um, or you can join by the direct volunteer pathway. Um, so this is where you can enroll online at joinallofus.org or um, through the app. Through both of these channels, participants create accounts. Um, they have access to a participant portal with a dashboard uh, to their data. It also provides um, access to consent and the uh, participant provided information surveys that are part of the program. And it helps you begin your journey. In the future, the program is hoping to add additional pathways to make it easier to participate. Um, just to be clear, to be eligible to enroll right now, you have to be over the age of 18 with decisional capacity to consent. So the program is starting by collecting a limited set of standardized data. Uh, from different sources that include those participant surveys I just mentioned, electronic health records, physical measurements, and biosamples. Uh, the data types will grow and expand um, as science, technology, and trust evolves. Uh, we have current pilots under development. One is richer EHR data, uh, getting data from health apps, fitness wearables, and also looking at returning genetic information. Uh, all of us is attempting to oversample from those historically underrepresented and biomedical research groups, those UBRs again. So this means that priority is being given uh, to those groups to ensure that the funding and infrastructure is available to maximize participant diversity um, in providing all of, all of this different information. Once the program's diversity goals have been met and funding permitting, all of us will move to include all willing participants in all aspects of the program. 
So where is the program now? As of January, there are more than 200,000 participants who are registered and are in the process of joining the All of Us Research Program. 115,000 of those are fully enrolled. I mentioned those UBR goals, 75% of participants come from one or more of the UBR populations, and 50% of them are from a racial and ethnic minority. So far, the program's on track. Um, amongst those core participants, that 115,000, 75% um, identify as from one or more um, underrepresented in biomedical research populations. So the program just launched in May of last year, um, coming up to a year on. Um, the program is already one of the largest and certainly one of the most diverse research cohort programs, and they're looking forward to hitting that one million mark and, and exceeding it. So I'd like to stop right here. That was kind of a whirlwind overview of the principles, the values, um, how people enroll, some of the targets. Are there any big holes that I can try and fill in for you right now? So this means I can quiz you. All right. So I will say the next two things I want to talk about are one, the um, talk a little bit more about UBRs and, and how they fit into the All of Us Research Program, and also talk a little bit more about data access with the program, and I'll end up talking about the NLM partnership. So right now, nothing, everybody feels good. Somebody asked you on the street, yes. So I kind of, hi, my name's Anya. I work at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, so one of my questions first was when you think about like, the data that you're collecting, how has your team and your partners talked about um, the social determinants of health and how you either capture that information with the diversity from geography to demographics that you're collecting and because that does play a role in health outcomes. Uh, yes, so um, I think that those are captured in the UBR populations that I'll talk to, but there are like eight different, uh, or sorry, there are nine different facets for what those UBRs are, including socioeconomic status, geography, um, age, uh, sex, gender, sexual orientation. Um, so um, all of those things are captured um, as a part of the participant enrollment process. Okay, and then my second question was, with the 200,000 participants that you've registered so far, have you had some interesting ways of connecting with those populations that typically don't have either trust in registering for studies or aren't in your typical places who, where they would be even asked? to participate. You are amazing. Thank you for standing up and asking these questions. So we're starting right here. Um, actually, the University of Cincinnati Health Sciences Libraries, from the, from the NLM perspective and our partner, um, is a great example of us partnering with some of these organizations. So using um, um, community ambassadors like libraries. So right now, I think the project they're doing is closing the health gap in Cincinnati. On Saturday, they held a research day at the Weston Library, where they talked um, with their research advisory board and community participants about kind of the value of research and why certain populations uh, should consider joining and how they can benefit from it. So um, that's from the library side, but there are over 30 um, part, um, community engagement organizations, so ambassadors from black Greek organizations to the uh, um, Asian Health Coalition to the National Alliance of Hispanic Nurses. So the program has really been intentional about going out, finding those trusted partners and communities, educating them about the program and using them as a way to get out. So lots of ideas are happening. I don't know if the, I'm looking for Tiffany, if the All of Us journey has been here. So there are two big uh, tractor trailers driving around the country, um, just stopping anywhere. We like to have them stop at libraries. Was that me? Um, stopping all over the country um, as a way to just, you know, you're going to Walmart or you're going to CVS, um, stop in and um, learn a little bit more about the program. So we're trying all different types of things, and I'll talk a little bit more about some other engagement activities in a bit. So, um, Amanda, Tiffany, Tiffany speaking, we are actually working on getting the journey here uh, in July. We can't promise anything right now, but we are in the process of connecting with them to have the journey come down here. And so the, the bus or the journey 
uh, affiliated with all of us is designed to educate the population and also help increase enrollment in the areas that it travels to. So the hope is to get them down here. Um, and so this talk today kind of works into that whole process. So we're working on it, just so you know. And look for information if we do get it. They will be coming here sometime in July. Hi, um, I'm Mike Link from the College of Medicine. I'm also the IRB chair, so I am interested in IRB approval of this project. You know, you're recruiting in Cincinnati. The UC IRB has not heard about this. I, I take it there's a, a central IRB that's reviewed the, pro the project? Yes, there is. And I would, um, I would say you are definitely a Kate question, Blizinski, B-L-I-N-Z, okay. Uh, so, uh, but yes, there is a central IRB, so I would say touch base with her. That is definitely out of my league. All right, wonderful. Okay, um, I noted that down as well. College of Okay, so um, with today's theme of diversity, equity, and inclusion in data, I wanted to take some time uh, to state the All of Us case for why participation from everyone, um, in particular participation from historically underserved communities, is vitally important. Um, first, I want to draw your attention back to a subset of the All of Us core values that directly relates so that participants reflect the diversity of the United States, participants are partners in the program, trust will be earned through transparency, and participants will have access to their information. Uh, for background, um, as late as 2016, only 19% of genome-wide association study populations consisted of individuals of non-European descent. Research has repeatedly demonstrated that genetic risk findings are not universally applicable that certain variants confer differential risk in populations with dissimilar ancestry. This data just reflects genome studies and specifically looks at ancestry, but similar discrepancies exist when examined through the lens of social factors like race and ethnicity, despite the fact that such social factors are known to contribute to disease risk and health outcomes. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, racial and ethnic minorities make up over a third of the U.S. population and less than 10% of participants in clinical trials. And their participation is disproportionately skewed toward earlier phase trials where there's a greater risk and poor potential outcomes. Today, minority, uh, okay, we already know that. So when we do get sick, this knowledge may um, help us identify the right treatment at the right time for the right person every time. That's why diverse research participation um, will help. Um, I think Dr. Dara Richardson Heron, the chief engagement officer, said it best in a recent article. Um, she was quoted in on Vox when she said, you really can't have precision medicine for all of us if all of us don't participate and aren't reflected in the research. I'd like to also note that um, on this slide, these are the um, ways that the All of Us Research Program identifies underrepresented and biomedical research populations. There's no traditional or set standard for uh, defining those, but these are the facets that the All of Us Program is looking at. It reflects that underrepresented, underrepresentation is a problem of more than just racial and ethnic homogeneity, and it's also intersectional. Continuing to make the case, um, let me come back up to the 30,000 foot level and remind us all what precision medicine is. It aims to take us into an era where healthcare is tailored to our lifestyle, our biology, and our environment, which may be shared amongst our racial and ethnic community or it may not. Precision um, medicine, again, asks us to look far beyond race and ethnicity. We live in a world with significant health disparities, which are well known but not well understood. Again, greater diversity in research participation may illuminate information and findings that can foster development of more effective treatments and cures for the conditions and diseases that plague underrepresented populations. This is really, really good news. As good and exciting as that news is, we know that participation is not a simple decision for everyone. Again, going back to some of our earlier questions. In fact, we know that many people are skeptical and very hesitant to participate in medical research with very good reason. There have been unspeakable instances 
where unethical testing and research were performed, often under the guise of medical treatment. And in other cases, the whole communities have been not invited to participate. Henrietta Lacks, participants in the Guatemala and Tuskegee syphilis trials, native populations, inmates, um, subjected to dioxin experiments. These are just a few examples of egregious abuse that's happened. Please know that the All of Us Research Program isn't shying away from these issues. The engagement team, particularly under the leadership of Dr. Dara Richardson Heron, is engaging specifically and directly with populations on these topics. Um, we're using trusted community and provider organizations and participant partners, as well as other key stakeholders to acknowledge and address these issues because we just must. Uh, the stakes are just too high not to. The program has the potential to break ground in so many ways. There's no manual for a project. There's no user guide. Again, there's no standard definition of what underrepresented in biomedical research populations are. But we do know that in order to ensure quadruple diversity in all of us, we must create value and build trust for all communities, particularly those who are understandably distant and hesitant to participate. We can't erase the past, but we can be authentic and honest about the transgressions of the past and genuinely, with overwhelming respect and empathy, acknowledge the legitimacy of the fears, concerns, and mistrust these unfortunate historic actions and realities instill in our communities. We're engaging community partners to serve as trusted intermediaries. Libraries are one of them. The program must also return value to participants. They must be involved. The program must do whatever it can to ensure that participants' privacy and security are protected. The program should do what it says it's gonna do and never ever ever repeat the, state, the mistakes of the past. At the same time, the program also should share the great news that research is a powerful change agent, one with the potential to begin chipping away at the unacceptable health disparities that continue to plague many of those in the communities we're engaging. All of us is committed to helping those who have concerns to understand that the only way we can learn more and one day eliminate health disparities is to have much more revert diverse and robust participation in all of us. So this is another participation area. I'd like to get some input from you again on what this statement means to you. Trust will be earned through robust engagement and full transparency. So what methods do you think that all of us should use to address this successfully broadly here in Cincinnati? How do we earn trust? Who do we work with? Any thoughts? Well, I think what you said before, making them partners and not participants is a big key to that. Um, I think that will make them more engaged and give, feel like they have more power over what they're doing. Thank you. Looking at the schedule for today, um, I'm sure you'll continue to um, have these discussions and other ideas will come up. But I will say what it also means uh, to the All of Us Research Program. It means that yes means yes and everything else means no. So the program um, is breaking down the consent process into um, progressive consent so that over time as participants engage with the program, they're continually consenting and opting in to different aspects of the program. They're not expecting participants to read and understand everything at the beginning and plus consent you know, in year one uh, might not cover everything that's happening in the program in year eight. It also means leveraging those trusted intermediaries, providing clear, comprehensive and convenient resources, meeting people where they are, 
and listening and being responsive to input. The All of Us program hasn't set easy goals. There's a lot of work to bring a million people together, especially a million people with the broad diversity that they're aiming for. Um, and again, we'll go back to pro, uh, participants as partners uh, to keep building the trust relationship the program is working to ensure that they're incorporated in everything related to the governance. And the participant voice is very important. When the program started, there were two participant ambassadors on the steering committee, we're up to seven now. Um, as well as community partners like the libraries. I represent the library community on the, the All of Us Steering Committee. So they're continuing to look for ways to engage and involve participants throughout the entire project. In addition to bringing the participant voice in, communicating out to prospective participants is another facet of relationship building. This slide includes all of the different community partners, um, and many of them, like the National Library of Medicine, um, represents a, kind of the national um, head of a group that's embedded in communities across the country. Uh, these folks are trusted validators and intermediaries who can speak to the value and importance of participation in research and there are more than 30 partners and it continues to grow. Another theme of, of the day-to-day -day series, of course, is data. So I'll now turn to talk a little bit about data access in the program uh, before I finish by highlighting NLM's work. Again, I wanna draw your attention back to the core values and the subset of them that address data access. Five and six, participants will have access to their information and data will be accessed for uh, broadly for research purposes. Um, one can distill the program into four basic parts uh, going from left to right, the engagement, enrollment, and collection of data, the transfer, curation, and storage of that participant data, and then it forks. Um, on the one hand, there's a maintenance of data resources which will be accessed by researchers, and on the other hand, you have information going back to participants in the return of information. Initially, the program uh, plans to collect around six modalities of data, but the types of data collected will adapt to the scientific and technological climate, and again, as we continue to build trust through the program. There are two main considerations for data access, uh, mirroring those last two parts of the data flow, considerations for researchers, and considerations for those uh, for returning information to participants. Looking at each one in turn, for researchers, the program is considering many different questions uh, related to the creation and maintenance of a platform that's open to the broad range, range of researchers. I said this earlier, I'll repeat again. Um, when all of us thinks about researchers, they think about everyone from high school students to community scienti uh, scientists to seasoned scientists from research institution around the world. These are all researchers in the All of Us book. Um, the framework to balance all of these values starts with a commitment to creating a resource that's accessible to a broad range of users um, and making possible accessibility to the wealth of data that the program's collecting. It consists of a central curated enclave that exists at the cloud. You remember the Data and Research Center exists at Van Vanderbilt. Um, users will access the data through a portal. You saw a snapshot of that workbench earlier. And there's no data removal from the cloud research uh, with the, ex uh, the exception of aggregate analytical results. All the other work, individual records, even aggregate data will, have, will stay in the cloud. All user access, of course, is not created equal. The data collected will be separated by sensitivity into public, registered, and controlled access tiers. Users will have access to one or more tiers and the level of scrutiny depends on the level of access for what you're looking for. The public tier, this is the data that poses the minimal risk to privacy of research participants. It's presented only in aggregate. The registered tier um, has some risk of identifying research participants and poses some privacy risk to participants. It can only be accessed by logging into the research platform. This is where you start getting into individual level data. Though the more sensitive level data is restricted to the controlled access tier. This poses the most significant risk to privacy of research participants. Things like sequence data lives here, as well as clinical notes and narrative data. Um, there's also a fourth tier of readily identifiable data that will require IRB review to access. 
I want to pause here for a moment to give you a sense of what researchers will have to agree to before accessing or using all of us data. The example statements here give you a sense of the direction of this code of conduct. Going back to data access, the program has adopted a data passport model. So instead of project proposals, the approval board approves researchers themselves, and the level of scrutiny reflects, again, the level of sensitivity of the tier for which they're applying. So if people are applying for public access, this is the anyone, anywhere, anytime tier. It's open without login. Um, it's summary, statistics, and aggregate data. The registered tier for researchers who want access to that um, that requires a data use agreement, identity verification, ethics training, and approval from a research committee. Controlled access, researchers who have access to the controlled tier of data, um, they have to meet the requirements of registered access as well as have an institutional signing official. Right now, this is where some of the challenges of being a broad access come into play. Um, because, uh, you know, who, if you're a citizen scientist or a community scientist, who is that institutional signing official? So the program is working on it. If you have any kind of genius ideas about, you know, uh, citizen scientists having access to the control tier, Kate would be very interested in hearing. After approval, users can create multiple project workspaces that live in the cloud. The workspaces can be collaborative, bringing multiple users together on a project, um, provided they all have the requisite level of access needed. And finally, for each workspace, user must provide a description of a project, the contributors, and information about those contributors, like when they last completed their ethics training, as well as the type of data used. The project records are then open to anyone, so that anyone can essentially audit the research being done in that workspace, particularly research that could be stigmatizing. So if someone comes across a project, they may flag it, which will trigger a review by the program's resource access board. The All of Us Research Hub, I mentioned it before, showed a little um, a screenshot of the workbench er earlier. Um, we anticipate that it will be available for researchers later this year. Um, this is a screenshot of the landing page at researchallofus.org. And again, you saw the, the workbench earlier. The site is being built out and tested right now. You can go there now, enter your email address, and you'll get a notification um, once the, the research hub goes live and you're able to go in to access um, data that's available now. So I want to sort of conclude this session by uh, talking a little bit about sample scientific opportunities um, and ways that all of us can advance research and equip healthcare providers with better, more powerful data to help tailor um, their care to individual patients. So one of the most famous examples of precision medicine are the two gene mutations that increase risks for breast, can breast and ovarian cancers. So knowing if a woman is a carrier of these mutations helps determine the appropriate prevention and treatment modalities and whether uh, helps to know whether those mutations are inherited by her daughters and siblings. According to the National Cancer Institute, the extent to which these mutations are present in the African American community is not clear. So these are the kinds of questions that the, all of us aims to investigate. Um, by having this rich, diverse, comprehensive data, the program hopes to spur research that addresses the array of bi biomedical objectives listed here. Again, that goes back to that eighth core value of the program. In addition, the program hopes that data collected will empower participants with information that facilitates improvement in their own health. So speaking of those participants, we know that the most important incentive for participation is learning about one's own health information. This leads to its own set of questions for the program when thinking about participants. They range from the impacts to participants on receiving this information, determining the level of support required from the program, and the line between research and clinical care. One example from among the many activities of the program to engage in serious discussions around these types of questions um, and to develop approaches to them is the 2017 All of Us Research Priorities Workshop. It was held um, two years ago now um, in March 2017 at Bethesda, and the program hoped to assess the state of the field 
for return of genomic information and to establish basic guidelines for the return of genomic results. Insights from that meeting about how to ensure that results are communicated to participants with different needs, capabilities, and interests were that first and foremost, we need to ask participants if they want data about themselves and how they want it. We also need to develop multiple modes with which to communicate. There are challenges around the digital divide, low literacy, and low health literacy. If the program is to reach its goals, it needs to be cognizant and sensitive to those limitations and build a means to overcome them. I will say that the program, this is one of the things that we work with with the National Library of Medicine, they aim to communicate everything at the fifth grade level and the program is bilingual. So now everything is at the fifth grade level for both English and Spanish. Success for the program um, as another insight is that the program starts small with pilot studies and then builds up on the findings rather than trying to capture everything at once. The program should take a no surprises policy, clearly communicate and be realistic with participants throughout the program and that the program should build on best practices from others. It shouldn't try to reinvent things. In addition to the workshop and other activities, um, NIH partnered with FDA and CMS to commission a National Academy study to look more broadly at return of results. And it brought together a range of diverse perspectives that looked at the current regulatory landscape, the evaluation of harms and benefits, and considering other research, uh, other alternative approaches to improve the process for returning results. The consensus recommendations, which are summarized on this slide, were released last year, and you can find the report. Also building on this, of course, there are many, many committees within the consortium with participant ambassadors represented on those committees who are also tackling these issues and engaged in these discussions. Around the ethical, legal, and social implications um, of research, the program envisions four buckets of support that it's poised to provide, including support for projects that address policy implications, projects that assess the value of research for stakeholders, and support for projects that directly appraise the different aspects of research, including the effects of decisions or policies on the conduct of research itself. And finally, support for convenings of LC and uh, bioethics communities. The program's approach to return of results focuses on participant education, participants opting in to receive information, maximizing participant safety and understanding around medically actionable information, and the availability of support services available to anyone, regardless of what results they are returned to them. And there are three main buckets of information that all of us is returning or piloting return of information to participants around. Um, as I hope you're hearing as a theme, the program is not tackling everything at once, but starting small and building as the program grows and matures. So I'm gonna pause here one more time before the last hurrah and get your reactions and thoughts. Any bright ideas? Engaging citizen and community scientists. So the last component of the program that I'd like to talk about is the intersection between the All of Us Research Program and my particular program at the library, which is a national network of libraries of medicine. That is around education. Um, so Dr. Brennan uh, was here last year and talked about the NLM strategic plan um, and where we're going over the next 10 years. Um, my particular program falls under goal two of the strategic plan, reaching more people in more ways um, through enhanced dissemination and engagement activities. Um, it was wonderful to uh, be a part of that kind of strategic future for NLM 
So both for the library and for all of us, um, the intersection there is public libraries as community centers across the country. So both with NLM and all of us research program, we're you know, inviting public libraries to the table. We're pulling up an extra seat to involve them in uh, the work that we're doing, particularly those that are specifically addressing health literacy and awareness and partnering them with our existing uh, medical library and, and medical information infrastructure so that they can, port, can support the needs of their uh, patrons. So the specific goals of the partnership between the All of Us Research Program and the National Library of Medicine um, are fall along these three goals. So again, hopefully you see engagement in a lot of this. So uh, there's education of both uh, library staff who are helping their uh, patrons, as well as community engagement, so helping libraries to engage their communities. And then finally, we specifically um, have a learning platform for and about the All of Us Research Program. Um, so uh, doing all of these helps us reach the two main goals, is helping libraries raise the health literacy or improve the health literacy in their communities, and also to raise awareness about the All of Us Research Program. So this is all made possible through our wonderful national network of libraries of medicine. We have 7,100 member libraries and organizations across the country. Our main um, membership types, or the, the most prominent members, are our academic health sciences, hospital, and public libraries. What we're doing more intentionally is strategically focusing on our public library partnership and partnering them with the faith-based, community-based, um, and other organizations who are part of NNLM. So really starting to integrate and knit together um, uh, patchworks of, of community and NNLM partners um, in geographic areas. I'll show a couple examples in a moment. Um, so to accomplish this new All of Us research program, we have two new centers, one for community engagement and one for training and education. I've already mentioned public libraries a couple times. Um, one of the ways that we are engaging with them is by partnering with the Public Library Association, which has been critical for us. This is the trusted um, organization for public library staff, and they are officially supporting the All of Us Research Program, as well as supporting their members and learning about the program, getting training and health information, um, and funding um, and supporting us as we fund innovative engagement activities. Um, as well as connect community partners who are interested in both health literacy, the All of Us Research Program, and reaching those UBR populations. So NNLM has those 7,100 members. A subset of them are a part of our community engagement network. It's just if a library who's interested in being involved, they can join. So we have something called the NNLM All of Us Community Engagement Network. And uh, these folks um, support, promote, and lead our All of Us engagement in libraries. It includes all types of library types as well as our area health education centers and other nonprofits that are focused on building awareness for the program in their communities as well as helping participants or potential participants who come in and have questions. We know that about 33% of questions asked in libraries are health related. So people who have questions, we're really um, instilling and building confidence in public library staff to help their, to help their patrons. Um, our second goal with the Community Engagement Network is to get health sciences and public library staff excited about the All of Us Research Program. So we're doing all kinds of fun stuff um, to um, hopefully get people excited and thinking about how all of us can help support their own institutional and organizational goals. And finally, um, the All of Us Program had a national launch back on May 6th. And now they're doing a series of regional launches where they focus on particular geographic areas and really get the community excited and riled up. And um, so our regional engagement co coordinators, who you see listed on this slide, are engaged in that effort as well. So there are a couple different ways that libraries can participate in our community engagement network. They can join us to raise awareness. They can work with us to develop programming and conduct projects in communities. Um, and they can also lead with us in areas. Um, so what you see on the slide are areas with some of our um, leading partners marked. As of last month, we had 247 libraries across the country who are active organizations working with us. The Training and Education Center has created an online platform for training about the program. Right now, it's um, internal facing. There's some consortium member training, but we've also done some other engagement activities on March 14th. 
We launched the All of Us Research Program Speaker Series. This is something that we're producing. It was on YouTube Live. Our first speaker was Dr. Francis Collins. Um, he was joined by Dara Richardson Heron, and they had a great overview of the program as well as a back and forth answering some questions um, from the live chat coming in. So if you have a moment, you can visit the All of Us Research Program channel. It's about half an hour um, to get a good overview of the program, but those are different ways that we're trying not to reach people in non-traditional ways. It's a great way to talk to participants. It's also a wonderful way to um, reach people who are not participants, but maybe want to engage in the conversation and ask questions. So that All of Us Speaker Series was launched on YouTube Live again on March 14th, and um, we're currently getting uh, more in the works. So please um, visit that and keep an eye on Join All of Us Conversations. So the areas where both our training and education center and our community education center overlap um, is in community engagement. So this is where they work together to amplify efforts and they're building on the existing strengths of our national network of libraries of medicine. We're already doing health literacy training and awareness. Um, and now we're just adding a focus on the All of Us Research Program as well as topics that might be of interest. Uh, for instance, if we're doing uh, you know, beyond an apple a day, learning about um, um, different health tips to improve health, we might focus on things like BMI, which is something that the All of Us Research Program asks participants um, um, to provide and then also gives that information back to them. So to help participants when they're getting information about their BMI or their, their physical measurements to understand what the impacts are for them. So as we're doing our health literacy training, we're pulling out those topics that are specifically relevant to all of us and doing that engagement. So we have um, bunches of different uh, activities that we're involved in. Again, the training for um, health sciences libraries, um, which are, is listed here. Um, we also have community engagement activities. This is one we're really excited about. It's pop-up libraries and laundromats across the country. So we've done some um, across the country. We have one opening up in DC. We have a lot in Minnesota, but it's a really great way on a Saturday morning for two hours to have the library come and um, you have families there to have them learn about health information, to have them uh, learn about the All of Us Research Program, and also just you know do something different while they're you know washing clothes for two hours on a Saturday morning. So we're really excited about uh, projects like that to really meet people where they are through libraries. And then finally, I talked about connecting in communities. Um, this is an example from our um, Midwest network and um, Midwest region in the network, but just really connecting uh, different partners across the, um, across the city to talk about all of us and talk about how they can reach populations and how libraries can be leveraged as community centers for either space, um, as well as places for education, as well as places for people to go who don't have access to technology to engage. So from pop-up libraries and laundromats to um, enhancing existing programs like the Nashville Public Library has something called Be Well at NPL. We just enhance that program to talk a little bit more about all of us topics. There's Women's Health Wednesday, Wednesdays at Chicago Public Library um, where we've um, incorporated things. And then on April 13th, I believe, is Citizen Science Day. And um, we're having a big citizen science megathon, hopefully with libraries from across the country who are participating in something called Stall Catchers. So we're all getting together, playing stall catchers, helping Alzheimer's research, also learning about health information. So we want to continue to do different kind of citizen and community science activities as well um, to get people conversant and knowledgeable and maybe interested in health information as they consider joining the All of Us Research Program. So I uh, lastly just want to say thanks to the leadership team within NNLM who's helping to move this forward. And thank you all very much for your attention, for your engagement, and for your questions throughout my remarks. So I look forward to continuing to participate in conversations today. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Amanda at this moment? Okay, the microphone is coming behind you there. And Good morning, my Good name morning. is Lillian, and I appreciate the innovative ways that you are working in the community, but I'm curious about whether you have reached out to some of the national um, 
science teachers or teachers organizations about incorporating this maybe into some school curriculums or health science programs? Um, so we do have um, a partnership with the Health Occupation Student Association and the National Library of Medicine does uh, present and engage uh, or exhibit at um, Science Teacher Association and school nurses are another one um, that are on our radar. Um, in terms of NLM specifically, we haven't targeted them yet and the All of Us Research Program, I have to look to see if they're one of those 30, but the point taken in terms of inc incorporating science teachers and schools to incorporate into the curriculum. Thank you. Hi, I'm Zach Reet with the Hi, Health Zach. Policy Institute of Ohio. Um, I saw one star in uh, Ohio for the public library partners. Do you happen to know who that is? Yes, can you come see me afterwards? It's like a very long I'd time. love to. Yes, and, and the one star was probably one of the major ones. That wasn't all 247, so I can give you all the partners, yeah. I'm Dominique Brand from Xavier University, and my question is, uh, are you collecting data on mental health? Which is probably more difficult to collect. Uh, I mean, it's not a um, physical measurement. It, uh, I cannot answer that question, but you should tweet all of us and ask them that. I will, yes. thank you. Use the hashtag. Mm -hmm. I will, thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for that presentation. We appreciate it. Um, I have a general question, and this actually might be a little bit outside of your domain, but what I wanted to find out is, considering that the U.S. is a melting pot of all different individuals from different countries, how well is it anticipated that this data set that's being collected may translate into populations outside of the U.S.? And have there been any talks, even just in the preliminary um, stages, about expanding it beyond the U.S. borders to be able to pick up on some individuals outside of the U.S. to kind of better answer some of these questions for other populations? Mm -hmm. So I am not aware of any of those discussions. I do know that we have a, um, the program has a big tall order just to get people living and working in the United States engaged. So I, I'm just, I'm not aware of that right now. Um, I would consider potentially the funding, well, let me not, okay, I won't speculate. So I would say tweet that question too. So one thing that, I'm gonna keep asking questions while we're waiting. Um, one thing that I learned about last night is Next lives here at the University of Cincinnati. And I was really excited to, um, as I was hearing about it, I thought that the partnership that the Health Sciences Library here has with the Cincinnati Public Library was a way in which um, they're talking about urban health um, and, and talking about it in a different way that maybe that fits into next uh, lives here. As you've heard about the All of Us Research Program and ways that maybe we could participate, do you all see connections between uh, that effort and, and next lives here at UC? That's probably for you, but <laughs> I'll catch you afterwards. So, you know, it's, it's a complicated study. People are providing informed consent. Are you familiar with the informed consent process? Is it all online? Is there an interaction? Can they call people while they're doing it? Or Yes, I can answer the question. So it is all online in the hopes to be accessible to as many people as possible. Um, it's both uh, written, also in uh, video. People can chat to ask questions. And, um, and I think I said earlier it was modular. So, um, but, and it's also written to be um, at the fifth grade reading level. Uh, for people. Did I answer your question? So there, there's an interactive part if they there have questions they can part. chat or? Yes, there's a number of screens. I think the first sign up screen, there are a number uh, of them when you sign up for the program, you uh, set up your account that walks you through each one of those. So it is interactive. Amanda, to answer your question about how Next Lives Here kind of ties in with the All of Us program, that was. Um, 
a great part of why we wanted a representative from the program to be able to come here, to be able to talk about how you know the, the program itself, the All of Us program, has an impact on urban health and minority health and can impact that. And that is one of the pillars of the Next Lives Here strategic plan that we are holding dear here at the University of Cincinnati. And so the idea is to reach the public uh, to be able to get them more engaged and to really be able to see, for them to be able to see UC as a partner with them when it comes to urban health and um, things of that nature. And so the idea with bringing the All of Us program here was an educational component, but also to be able to talk about the impact, the greater impact that it can have on urban communities. So absolutely it does tie in. That's wonderful. And it also ties in with the NLM strategic plan as well. So this is a perfect kind of overlap. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Karen Banks, and I'm a professor here at the University of Cincinnati. Love your comments, and I'm very excited about the work that you're that you're doing. I had a, a comment uh, earlier about that statement that you had. You asked us what, and it took me a while because I was contemplating all the words before I could get uh, get it out. But now it comes back to me because we're talking about it again. I think that uh, there are a couple of things. I think that, uh, and I say this to my doctoral students all the time, they're sitting here, so they're probably gonna say, oh boy. Um, you know, it's all about context. It's all about context and when we're doing this, and I think as scientists who are engaged in the community and doing community-based uh, participatory research, mm -hmm. it's very important for us to understand a couple of things. One, that is that um, we do a lot of data raping, meaning that uh, we go out into the, into the communities and we get data and then we um, want to uh, utilize that data without really in, including in a very transparent and real way the people in the community, meaning that they're not involved at the beginning. We develop the proposal because mm. you know we know better, so forth and so on. So I, I, I really um, like that what I'm hearing is that they're engaged at the beginning as more challenging as that is for those of us that are quote so intelligent end quote um, if we're really going to be able to make a difference and be impactful then they have to be there at the beginning for as long as it takes having said that i think that the important piece of this is that this work this type of work is a marathon and not a sprint mm. and so we have to be able to accept acknowledge and accept that it's a little piece at a time. And I, I think you, you kind of hinted at that in some of your remarks that you know this doesn't go fast. Um, I know that I've had the opportunity to do some work here in town and people want the answers yesterday. You know, we, we're still on our road of, just, of being able to cure cancer. Um, and the things that we have been able to do, it didn't take, it didn't happen overnight. And so this is that same kind of work mm -hmm. because of the context. We've had some um, uh, scientific, bioscientific bio research done here in Cincinnati that has interfered with the whole level of trust among uh, people of color, African Americans in particular. And so those of us who are here in this community have to recognize that um, until such time, we've been able to uh, regain the trust yes. of people um, that it's going to take time. So subsequently, we have to be very transparent, very consistent, and as you said, yes means yes, and no means no. So I, I'm very excited about this and seeing this work because the whole notion of moving into pre precision medicine, precision um, healthcare, is so very important if indeed we are going to be able to close the healthcare disparities gap that has been existing for way too long, way too long. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Bharat. I have a question on how you are collecting the data. I'm more, I'm trying to understand if there is any bias in the collect collection of data. So my question is, is the participation in this program voluntary or is there any incentive associated with it? 
is the participation in the program voluntary? Yeah. Yes. Um, and you said something about collecting data. Uh, I want to understand, like, is there any incentive for the participants? Or? Oh, incentive for participants. Uh, there's a $25 gift certificate for participating. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, that's a very interesting question. When we talk about the uh, program, um, often to library audiences, one of, that's one of the first questions that's asked, as well as what is the benefit and potentially that relationship between um, insurance providers and will insurance providers get access um, to this data for participants? So I'm just saying that to say, please nobody ask that question right now, but that's something that um, uh, when we're thinking about the value to participants and trust, and that just sort of brings up all of those issues that we talk about. And you know, $25 might be a lot to some, might not be a lot to others. Um, so uh, one of the engagement challenges and opportunities for the program is to think about you know, other messages that really resonate with communities, uh, that beyond that initial incentive that will keep them, uh, well, that will get them interested in participating and keep them engaged over time. The clock says 10.30. I think it's time for a break, but maybe there's one more question. I think we have one last question over here. No pressure. Um, sorry, I'll make it quick. Um, so I know you mentioned uh, one of the aspects of like research collection was there was like, a bilingual aspect of it, um, but I guess I'm interested in like how are you guys addressing like barriers to linguistic navigation? So like not only just like speaking different, ling like the participants not speaking English, but also like, um, like maybe with like ASL or also like giving them the language to communicate like mental health information and like so being able to quantify that. Um, I will say that I will say, please send that question to, to Kate okay. as well. Um, I have thoughts, but I don't want to be wrong. So I will okay. say that's a very good question, and please ask. But um, I can say that addition to the the two languages, um, disability status is one of the underrepresented in biomedical uh, research populations, and um, there are some partners, include the Association of. Anyway, so there's some um, disability partners who are a part of the program who are working on shaping, uh, for instance, those core values and reshaping those um, to be resonant with the uh, community for people with disabilities. And also with the, with the library program, we're also working on building out our resources in ways so we have consultants and others on board to help evaluate our resources for things like that. So people with visual impairments as well as uh, auditory impairments, like how can, how can we uh, reshape and adapt our resources to be in a way that can be accepted and um, and useful to those communities. But I would say, please ask all of us research program more about that. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much. Again, let's give uh, Amanda a applause. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to have about a 15 minute break until we start the um, health equities and disparities panel. Um, I would request that the panelists make their way over to the stage um, to help to get ready for your presentation. Um, for housekeeping things, the bathrooms are just outside of this uh, hall here, so you can go there for the restrooms. And I think they've unfortunately, maybe the coffee's still there, maybe some, uh, Food is still over there, um, but they're starting to set up for lunch, so um, make use of that. thought we were on. All right, we're getting ready to go ahead and get started for our first panel session for today. 
Before I introduce the speakers, I would ask that when we do open it up for uh, questions and comments, that before you kind of ask your question or give your comment, if you would please give your name and your affiliation, uh, so we'll have that idea on individuals who are present today. Um, also, just keep in mind that questions will be asked immediately after the presentation, and if there is time after all of our speakers have presented, then we'll open it up for more questions from the general audience to any of the speakers that are present here. Our first presenter is Reem Alley. She will, uh, she's coming from the Health Policy Institute of Ohio. Reem Alley is the Vice President of Healthcare System and Innovation Policy at the Health Policy Institute of Ohio. She leads work on current and emerging health policy is issues related to healthcare system and access, healthcare spending, social determinants of health and equity. She also co-leads the development of the Institute's Health Value Dashboard and is currently leading the Institute's contracted work to develop the state's maternal and child health and maternal infant and early child care home visiting assessment. So Reem Ali is going to come and she's going to speak on her presentation entitled Closing Ohio's Health Gaps, Moving Towards Equity. Thank you, Tiffany. Good morning. Good morning. A little louder. Good morning. Good morning. All right, let's oh, we'll just wait a second. How many of you are familiar with HPIO, the Health Policy Institute of Ohio? Just a few hands. So we are a let's see if I'm going the right way. Okay. Well, first, more, most importantly, if you want to tweet. Here are, um, here's my handle and the handle of our organization, HPIO. We encourage you to tweet and stay active in the conversation um, for my presentation and throughout all of the panelists' presentation this morning. The Health Policy Institute of Ohio is a small, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and our mission is to partner with policymakers and other stakeholders to provide the independent, analysis needed to create evidence-informed state health policy. So our primary audience is state policymakers, but we work with a variety of sectors and stakeholders across the field to really move towards evidence-based health policy. Here you see some of our, um, well, all of our core funders for the organization. Our organization was founded back in 2003. Uh, most of these, these uh, funders were um, with us back at that time and we've added a few more along, along uh, the way. So here are, are three key takeaways for my presentation this morning. And I'm going to be sharing data from a few of the publications that we have put out at at HPIO and highlight some of um, the, the analysis that we've done around health disparities and health inequities in our state. So our first key finding is that there are many groups of Ohioans who experience gaps in health outcomes in our state and that the opportunities Ohioans have are really shaped by the environments in which we live, and we know that there are evidence-based strategies that can be deployed strategically, both at the state and local level, to really close those health gaps. We released, starting in 2014, a health value dashboard. How many of you have heard of HPIO's health value dashboard? All right, a few hands. So the dashboard is a tool to track Ohio's progress towards health value. It tracks outcomes across seven domains, and our health value rank is a composite measure of how we perform on population health and health care spending. And I'll share some data from the dashboard. But I wanted to bring up the dashboard because that's where really our focus on health disparities and equity started. Um, in the dashboard, in our, our past dashboard, which was in 2017, and we are going to be releasing our 2019 dashboard this week um, with some new but same results, we included in the 2017 dashboard, which was our second edition, a set of equity profiles. And the profiles disaggregated data by race, ethnicity, 
income level, education level, and disability status. And this is state level data because our focus was on um, what, what our gaps look like at the state level, which might be different from some of the, the work that you all are doing in this room. But that's really where our focus on disparities and inequities emerged, and we've continued to make that a key focus of our work as we've moved forward. We released a publication in the fall of, of 2018 called Closing Ohio's Health Gaps. And in that publication, we provide data on many of the disparities and inequities we see across the state, as well as provide a set of evidence-informed strategies that can be implemented to close those health gaps. And I'll be sharing more information from both of these, these publications in just a bit. But before we get started, I think it's really important that we are kind of all on the same page when we talk about health equity. So I'm just going to pose the question to all of you and feel free to shout whatever comes to mind. But when you think of health equity, what are some of the words or terms that, that come to mind? Say that again. Access. Affordability. What else comes to mind when you think about equity? Cancer rates. Cancer rates. Okay. Accessibility. Accessibility. Injustice. Injustice. Availability. Availability. All right. These are all terms that that do resonate in people's minds when we talk about health equity. To provide a common understanding of health equity and a foundation for advancing health equity in Ohio, we brought together a multi-sector advisory group to help to come to a consensus definition on what, what we mean when we talk about health equity. We reviewed national sources for definitions of health equity and came to consensus on the definition that you see here. And this definition really highlights the what health equity means, and then also the how can we achieve health equity. So when we talk about health equity, all of those terms really do come to mind. So access, accessibility, um, injustice. And what we're, we're trying to achieve when we talk about health equity is that, that everyone is able to achieve their, their full health potential. That's what we're trying to get to when we talk about health equity generally. And the way that we can get there is by addressing historical and contemporary injustices, and removing obstacles to health, which include things like racism, discrimination, and other barriers that, that groups of Ohioans that experience poor health, poor health outcomes often face. And this is just kind of a leveling of the playing field. So when we talk about equity, at least for this presentation, this is what we're referring to, making sure that all groups of Ohioans, all Ohioans are able to achieve their full health potential. And understanding that, we have two terms, both disparities and inequities. And we, we often use these terms interchangeably, but they really mean two different things. When we talk about health disparities, we're talking about gaps in health outcomes across population groups. So this includes things like infant mortality rates, so differences in infant mortality, or in your overall health status. And when we talk about inequities, we're really talking about the underlying drivers of these health disparities. So these are considered to be differences in the distribution of social, economic, environmental, physical, or healthcare resources. It includes differences in access to a, uh, a, self, a, a job that pays a self-sufficient income, high quality housing, adequate transportation that can get you to, to your place of employment. All of things are inequities or underlying drivers that lead to the gaps in outcomes that we see across, across populations in Ohio. Now, the first key takeaway that I shared is that Ohioans, many groups of Ohioans, experience, experience troubling gaps in health outcomes. And I'm going to share with you what that looks like. As I mentioned in our health value dashboard, we created a set of equity profiles and we've, we've updated those profiles for the 2019 dashboard to, to take a look at how Ohioans with disabilities, low income Ohioans, Ohioans with low educational attainment, and different racial and ethnic groups um, experience health outcomes and, um, and what that gap in outcomes really looks like. 
We measured the magnitude of difference between the group with the best outcomes. So for example, if we were looking at um, people with disabilities, we would look at those with disabilities and those without and, and e examine the magnitude of difference between the group that had the best outcomes, which after are oftentimes people without disabilities, and then the group that had the worst outcomes, which would um, oftentimes be people with disabilities. Here you see that there were about 29 metrics that we included in these equity profiles across health outcomes, access to care, uh, healthcare system, performance, uh, social, economic, and physical environment, and you'll note that there was a lot more data available by race and ethnicity, although there are issues with that data, which I'll touch upon um, towards the end of my presentation, than there were by um, disaggregated by income or education level or disability status. But where the data was available, we did include for those 29 metrics. And what we found was that Ohioans with low income and black Ohioans in particular experienced the largest disparities or inequities across metrics. Here is a measure that continues to elude us as a state of infant mortality by race and ethnicity. And you see here that there is a, um, a gap between particularly black Ohioans and white Ohioans where black infants in the state are three times less likely to reach their first birthday as compared to, to white babies in the state. We also see gaps in outcomes by educational attainment. An Ohioan who did not graduate high school is almost two times more likely to report having fair or poor health as compared to an Ohioan who completed high school or received their GED. And here you see by disability status, Ohioans with a disability are nearly four times as likely to uh, report having depression as compared to an Ohioan who does not have a disability. When possible, we also estimated the impact if a disparity or inequity was eliminated between the group with the worst outcomes and the group with the best outcomes. So here's an example of what that looked like. If we had all Ohioans who were um, under 99% of the federal poverty level at the same uh, exposure to secondhand smoke, as those that were above 400% of the federal poverty level, that would impact nearly 127,000 children in Ohio. It's a pretty significant number. And that's really underestimating how many Ohioans would be impacted if we achieved health equity. And that's because it's only looking at the two extremes, the group with the lowest income and the group with the highest income. But if we really wanted to achieve health equity, all of those groups, between 100 to 399 percent of the federal poverty level would also experience that same rate of exposure. And so we would actually see more Ohioans, more children in Ohio that would not be impacted by secondhand smoke exposure. Here's what it looks like for children in poverty. So if we eliminated the inequity or this gap here, 130,000 black children in Ohio would not be living in poverty. Again, if we wanted to implement this and really achieve equity, many, many more children in Ohio would be, would be impacted. We also note that across our state, it matters where you live. There is a gap of almost 30 years, 29 years in life expectancy at birth, depending on where you live in Ohio, ranging from a low of 60 years in a census tract in Franklinton, uh, the Franklinton neighborhood in Franklin County, all the way to a high of a little over 89 years in the Stowe area of Summit County. So you can be living in the same county in Ohio, um, maybe even in the same city, the same neighborhood, and have vast differences in your life expectancy at birth. And when we looked at these census tracts with the, the highest and the lowest life expectancy, another interesting pattern emerged. What we found was that census tracts with the lowest life expectancy had a higher percent than the state average of, of black Ohioans and Ohioans with a disability. So those were living at um, a disproportionately higher um, number in those census tracts than in other census tracts in the state. 
And then there were also more Ohioans living in the census tracts with the lowest life expectancy who did not graduate high school. And the average income in these census tracts was less than half of the state household median income. Again, that sh shows you or demonstrates that there are multiple factors that are really driving gaps in outcomes, and we can see that income and education are just two of those, those components. We always ask or get asked the question, um, you know, what, 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 why is this really, why does this matter? What, and, and for most of you in this room, all of you really, you get it. You understand why this matters. But when you're explaining it to maybe a state policymaker, a state legislator who, who doesn't really connect the dots between why this is important, we have, have, to, have to often bring them back to why, why this does matter for Ohio overall. Over the past few decades, we have seen that our health outcomes have really worsened over time and that our health care spending has increased over time as compared to other states. And we know that this trajectory is just not sustainable. HPAO's most recent health value dashboard, which was our 2017 edition, Ohio ranked 46th on health value, which means Ohioans are living less healthy lives and are spending more on health care than people in most other states. We ranked 43rd on population health, and 31st on healthcare spending, so in the bottom two quartiles across all states. And we know, given the data, given how many Ohioans have, are impacted by gaps in outcomes, that in order for us to move the needle on health value and be a healthier state and have a higher value in the spending and the investment and resources that we, we, uh, we put in to our state, we have to address the gaps and outcomes that we are seeing across various population groups. Now, going back to why we have these health gaps, and this is a quote from a friend of HPIO, Stephen Wolf, who is out of the um, Virginia Commonwealth University, where he talks about health as being more than health care, and that the same is true for health equity. So health is more than health care, and the same is true for health equity. Research estimates that of the modifiable factors that influence our overall health, only about 20% is attributed to clinical care. 50% is attributed to our social, economic, and physical environment combined, and then 30% to our health behaviors. What this means is that our health is influenced by a number of factors, and that access to care is necessary, but it's not sufficient to improving health. And the same is true for health equity. Access to care or focusing on access to care alone is not going to close Ohio's health gaps. A family with a low income may not be able to afford to live in a resource-rich community, is likely to experience higher rates of crime and violence. That family may find difficulty uh, having a safe place for their children to play or even for them to exercise. And all of these factors combined really influence the overall health of that family and of that individual. In addition to this, many Ohioans also face the enduring consequences of both historical and contemporary obstacles to health. It includes racist and discriminatory policies and practices that have been put, been put in place and that continue to exist, uh, such as residential redlining, predatory lending, which we know disproportionately impacts communities of color and low-income communities, and we can see that the remnants of these policies and practices still exist today. So here you see residential segregation for Ohio's largest seven cities. And all seven of Ohio's largest cities are on the highly segregated or more segregated end of the spectrum. So we see that these policies and practices, some of which have um, are no longer in place or are no longer, have no longer been implemented or um, the, the, the remnants are, are still clearly in place. On a, a more hopeful note, we also know that there are evidence-based strategies to closing these health gaps. We look to two specific 
evidence registries that examine whether or not the research shows the strategy if implemented is likely to reduce health disparities. And that's County Health Rankings, What Works for Health, and the Community Guide, where they have a set of, of strategies that they've identified as equity strategies that have uh, research that, that demonstrates that they can be effective in closing health gaps. How many of you are familiar with these, these evidence registries? My colleague is back. I'm glad he is. Well, well these, are, these are really great tools to use, especially if you're looking at what can be done at a community level and what types of policies or practices have been put in place that can then lead to a reduction in disparities or gaps in outcomes. These are two great sources to go to. We looked to these sources to identify a key set of strategies that, if implemented, could potentially reduce gaps in outcomes. And you'll see some of those strategies listed on these crates here. And these crates are symbolic because we know that in order for us to close gaps in outcomes across different population groups, we need to provide more targeted and tailored supports to these groups of Ohioans. So some of the strategies that you see here are school-based health centers, and I know Cincinnati has uh, implemented a number of school-based health centers and are, are really strong in this evidence-based strategy. Um, and another one is access to green spaces and parks, ensuring that those parks and green spaces, when available, are accessible uh, to communities of color, low-income communities, and people with disabilities, and having good public transportation systems. And then the earned income tax credit can really impact particularly low-income families and Ohioans who um, can, can use that as an additional source of income. And the, the existing earned income tax credit currently in Ohio is not refundable. There is some legislation, though, to increase the cap on um, this tax credit, so it allows for a, a higher um, refund for, for Ohioans with low income. This is a framework for action, and I know it might be difficult to see, but this is a graphic that is uh, from the Closing Health Gaps publication that HPI released and is on our website. So if you're interested in looking at it more closely, you can go to our website, which is um, hpio.net, and uh, look for this brief. But it's a framework for action to address health disparities and inequities at a local or community level. And I just want to highlight two particular uh, steps, which is assessing needs and resources, which emphasizes the need to collect quantitative and qualitative data to identify disparities and inequities, and then the evaluation. So oftentimes, we, we do these community health assessments or needs assessments. We identify groups that we know we want to, to really um, improve outcomes for, but then there's no evaluation of whether or not outcomes are being improved. So those are two critical pieces to ensuring that we are moving towards achieving equity at the state level and at the local, local level. I wanted to touch briefly on some of the challenges that we see, um, particularly when we're looking at state level data, and I know that these challenges exist at the local level as well. So just getting to desegregated data can be very difficult. You saw the slide that I shared earlier where you saw um, that for race ethnicity, there was uh, a larger data set available, still limited. Um, but more so than if data was disaggregated by income level, education level, or by disability status. And there are um, other, many other population groups for which we cannot get disaggregated data at the state level. And um, one of those groups are sexual and um, gender minorities, so gender identity minorities in the state. We have very uh, difficult time getting state level data. Uh, we know that that these communities experience higher rates of violence and victimization. We know that they have trouble accessing health care, but we don't have the data for it at the state level, and that can be a, a, a huge barrier to, to pushing policy at the state level that can address the needs of these communities. We know that it's difficult to get data at a subpopulation level, and sometimes aggregate data can mask issues. So for example, Asian Ohioans or Asian Americans often do relatively well compared to other racial and ethnic groups in aggregate 
um, in regards to health outcomes. But we know when you dig a little deeper that there is a great deal of diversity in that population. And for example, Bhutanese and Nepalese refugees in Ohio, in Ohio tend to experience um, higher rates of, of suicide, mental health issues, and you can't really get to that level of detail at the state level. So we see some barriers and obstacles to data there as well. And then of course, getting to local level data can be particularly difficult um, when you are uh, utilizing national or state surveys. Um, and, and that can be a barrier to um, pushing policy, not only at a local level, but at a state level, particularly for uh, legislators from, from certain districts who want to see how, how their community is doing on different, different health outcomes and um, related factors that influence health. We, I just wanted to share that we have a series of dashboard release forms. I mentioned that our 2019 Health Value Dashboard, will, which will incorporate a series of equity profiles in it again, updated and really focused on telling a more um, cohesive narrative about the gaps and outcomes we see in our state and what is driving those gaps and outcomes. Our, our release is this Thursday in Columbus, but we'll also be hosting regional forums in North Canton towards the end of the month, and then here in Cincinnati on April 17th. So if you have not um, heard about this or have registered for it, I really do strongly encourage you to, to attend one of these regional forums, and you'll be hearing from HPIO as well as some national experts and some local experts as well uh, on what they're doing to move Ohio towards improved health value and address gaps and outcomes. Just back to our key takeaways, we know that many Ohioans experience gaps in outcomes, that the opportunities Ohioans have to be healthy are shaped by the environments in which they live, and there are evidence-based strategies that can be deployed to move Ohio towards health equity. Feel free to connect with us. Here's HPIO's information, and I'm happy to take, take questions as long as there's time. Hi, my name is Lisa Sloan, and I'm the founder of More Inclusive Healthcare. Thank you for your presentation. Um, one of the things that I think is missing is the focus on health care disparities. So disparities that exist within health systems. And health systems all collect race and ethnicity data. Um, but very few actually stratify any quality measures by race and ethnicity. So I'm just wondering um, what can we do from a policy level to encourage health systems to stratify their quality measures because we know that when they do that they have the opportunity to improve those disparities in care. Absolutely. So health care, again, is a critical component of addressing gaps and outcomes. And we do see that hospitals, often they collect the information. It's not collected consistently across hospitals. That's another barrier. So for example, you can't really um, compare hospital A to hospital B or hospital C because they all collect the data differently. At a policy level, there can be some things done around uh, the standardization of data collection. Um, that's often quite nuanced, and I don't know that there is appetite at the state level for doing that, although I think that there is movement towards, towards getting there. Um, but, but even at a local or community level, every hospital is required to conduct a community health needs assessment. That needs assessment really needs to look at data disaggregated by different population groups and identify which groups are experiencing poorer health outcomes. And as part of that, healthcare data is critical so they can access data within their, their health system and really do that disaggregation and display and show it within their community health needs assessment. So that's, that's a requirement as part of the IRS um, tax exempt status. Um, that they conduct these needs assessments. And they are supposed to engage community members in those efforts. And so to the extent that community members are engaged, 
that these issues are raised at a local level and, um, and that hospitals are, are willing to share that data to really identify where the priorities should be for the community that they, they need to focus on to improve community health, then I think that that could be a lever to, to pull as well. Other questions? All right, well thank you. Thank you, Rain, for that discussion, for that presentation. Um, I realized I asked you guys to introduce yourself, but I neglected to introduce myself, so in case you're wondering. My name is Tiffany Grant. Um, I currently serve as the Assistant Director for Research and Informatics at the Health Sciences Library. Our next speaker is Tammy Menzel. Uh, she is currently the Assistant Director for Programs and Projects at the University of Cincinnati's Academic Health Center. Tammy served as the program director for the transformation of mission-based healthcare through diversity, equity, and inclusion project that's been aimed at bolstering the diversity in the healthcare workforce and eliminating health disparities in urban communities by identifying, testing, and adopting evidence-based strategies and tools. She also served or was form formally in the College of Nursing at UC, where she was the research associate and program director providing leadership and support on six funded research projects that totaled over $4.6 million. Tammy is going to speak to us about, her top, her, uh, un, about the topic, Understanding Health Disparities and Perceptions of Discrimination in Greater Cincinnati. So good morning. So my presentation today will really um, focus on some of the disparities that we see here in Cincinnati. So it's, it's great that I went second after Reem, as a lot of what she focused on was um, within the state of Ohio. Whoops. There we go, okay. Okay, so along with myself, my research team is Dr. Greer Glazer, Dean College of Nursing and Associate VP for Health Affairs, along with Dr. Barbara Tobias, Chair, Department of Family and Community Medicine in the College of Medicine and the Medical Director of the Health Collaborative. So here are my takeaways today. Um, again, along the same lines with Reem, um, I hope you come away with an understanding of what health disparities are why they are important, what contributes to them, what disparities we have in Cincinnati, understand the potential link between feelings of discrimination and health disparities, and leave with an appreciation of the important strength and limitations of the work being done by our academic health center colleges to improve health equity, produce a culturally competent healthcare workforce, and increase the diversity of our student body. So health disparities can be defined as differences in illness, injury, or life expectancy of one group versus another. And we commonly view these through the lens of race and ethnicity, but they can also occur across other spectrums such as socioeconomic status, age, location, gender, and sexual orientation. So health disparities are important because they limit health and well-being of a particular group and result in higher than necessary health care costs. It's estimated that 30% of direct medical costs for underrepresented groups are excess costs of health care because of these disparities. It is also estimated that our economy loses around $309 billion per year because of the direct and indirect cost of these disparities. And as our population becomes more diverse, it's even more important to address these health disparities. And as you all know, it's the right thing to do. Your health and well-being should not be based upon your race, your ethnicity, how much money you make, or where you live. My favorite quote of all, of all times is by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. In Cincinnati, we have nine Fortune 500 companies. 
and 15 Fortune 1000 companies headquartered here. This ranks us higher than New York, Boston, Chicago, or Los Angeles for the number of Fortune 500 companies per resident. Yet, we have significant social and economic disparities in our region based upon race, poverty status. Your life expectancy here in Cincinnati can also vary up to 20 years depending upon you live, where you live, and we'll look at an infographic at this later. In 2015, the Urban League of Greater Cincinnati published an excellent report titled The State of Black Cincinnati 2015, Two Cities. And in this report, if we look at some of the economic disparities we find, we have 14,000 families living in poverty in the city of Cincinnati, of which 76% are African American. Homeownership also varies greatly here by race. 75% for whites compared to 33% for African Americans. In our Cincinnati public school system, 63% of students are African American and 73% are economically disadvantaged. The City of Cincinnati Health Department published this life expectancy graph looking at it by gender and race in Cincinnati and Ohio. And the most variability occurs here when we look at the life expectancy for African American females. They have the lowest life expectancy if they live in Cincinnati, a little bit higher in the state, and a little bit higher in the overall US. We find the same thing for African American males. The lowest Cincinnati, and then we increase slightly for the state and a little slightly for the US. Understanding these differences is important and so are ways to help us improve. So this is the infographic that I mentioned earlier. This was also published in the Community Health Assessment in 2017 by the Cincinnati Health Department. So this graph shows a 20 year difference in life expectancy based on your neighborhood. For example, if you live in North Avondale, Paddock Hills, it's expected for you to live to about 87 years of age compared to if you live in Avondale, which if I had a highlighter here, which is right below Avondale, it's expected you would only live to 68 years of age. The lighter the color, the longer the life expectancy. What's interesting is many of our large healthcare systems are sitting in the very dark blue areas, which are the areas with the shortest life expectancy. Interact for Health is a philanthropic foundation serving our community focused on improving health of all people. They serve as a catalyst by promoting health equity through grants, education, research, and policy engagement. They also conduct research and collect data to monitor and evaluate. So in 2017, they asked people, in general, how would you rate your health? Would you say it's excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? Overall, about half of those surveyed rated their health as excellent or very good. But look at the difference here between being a college graduate, 66% reported good health, compared to those with less than a high school diploma at only 24%. So these results show us that more educated adults report better health. So this graph compares self-reported health and your economic status. 28% of the adults earning 100% or less of the federal poverty guidelines only reported um, excellent or very good health at 28%. It bumps up to 48% for those who earn between 100 and 200%, and even higher at 56% for those earning more than 200%. The higher your econ economic status, again, the higher your reported health status. What's interesting is our United Way of Greater Cincinnati has had a bold goal that 70% of our population reports their health as excellent or very good, but as you can see, we've not been successful in meeting this. 
So here are some of the contributing factors for these health disparities. There are individual factors such as your own health behaviors, from maintaining a healthy weight to following medical advice to how you eat. But there are many healthcare provider factors such as if the provider has any biases, how well they are culturally competent and able to give care, any linguistic barriers, and the patient provider communication. We also have healthcare system barriers such as how they are organized, financed, and accessed. And lastly, we do have the societal environmental factors that we've discussed, such as the poverty, education, proximity to care, and neighborhood safety. There have been several surveys conducting over the past few years in our region asking about perceptions of discrimination, and we'll discuss each of these next. In 2012, Aligning Forces for Quality Project with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation surveyed our community to ask, have you ever felt that a doctor or medical staff judged you unfairly or treated you with disrespect because of your race or ethnicity? Overall, 2% reported yes, compared to 10% of African Americans who reported yes. They also asked about, have you ever been judged unfairly or treated with disrespect because of your ability to pay or the type of health insurance you have? Overall, 12% reported yes, compared to 18% African Americans. In 2013, our research team worked with Interact for Health to add questions to their community health status survey. We asked if either a lack of health insurance or the type of health insurance had been a barrier to finding a trusted provider. First, we found that a lack of or type of health insurance was a barrier to finding a trusted provider. We also found that young, poor, and less educated were more likely to report insurance as a barrier. And lastly, we found African Americans were more likely to report insurance as a barrier. When we asked about your race or ethnicity, was that a barrier, we found African Americans and other races were more likely to say race or ethnicity was a barrier. And we found the poor and uninsured were more likely to report race or ethnicity as a barrier. In 2017, our team worked again with Interact for Health to survey perceptions of discrimination. This time we asked, have you ever felt that a doctor or medical staff judged you or treated you unfairly with disrespect because of your race or ethnicity? Overall, 4% said yes, while 14% of African Americans said yes. When we asked about their ability to pay or the type of insurance they, they had, we found it was a factor for 13% overall compared to 19% for African Americans. When we asked if they thought they would have received better care if they belonged to a different race or, eth or ethnic group, we found more than two in 10 African American adults, or 21%, said yes, compared to only 5% of white adults. When asked if, if they thought they would receive better care if they spoke English more fluently, 7% of African American adults said yes, compared to 2% of white adults. So now that you know about the disparities and the perceptions of discrimination, what can we do to improve? So as the only academic health center in our region, we have a moral and ethical obligation to work to improve these health disparities and work also to improve the perceptions of discrimination. We are also the educational institution for many of the students who will be our future healthcare workforce. So we have the opportunity to improve. So our journey in this work started in 2012 when UC was selected as, as one of five academic institutions to participate in the Urban Universities for Health project. It was NIH funded and it was grounded on the premises that universities and academic health centers can serve as an anchor in urban communities as they are positioned to drive improvements. So some significant opportunities, or accomplishments that we achieved through this in our work was we developed an executive council 
and we found it critical for effecting change and championing our work within the institution. We also increased awareness and support of educational pipeline programs and developed a social media campaign to increase enrollments of diverse students at UC. We also developed an institutional data dashboard to track outcomes with diversity and the development of a community advisory board. As our work was ending in 2017, 2016, excuse me, our team was funded three more years by our then president, Santa Ono, to continue the work into 2019. So as mentioned before, one of our biggest accomplishments was the development of a community advisory board. And it was made up of community leaders from churches, public schools, businesses, philanthropic groups, advocacy, healthcare, and government. And we have met faithfully with this group once a quarter over the past seven years. We've received some glowing accolades from members that this board has been the best community group to which they've ever belonged. We believe this is because we set the agenda with them, not for them. We solicit their advice and feedback and work in partnership with them. One of the groups that evolved from this work has been a regional health care workforce diversity work group where all of our healthcare systems have been working together to improve health disparities and workforce diversity. Other initiatives within the academic health center colleges that we've worked on include surveying all of our students for them to self-evaluate their own cultural competency and the cultural competency of the curriculum with the goals that the Academic Health Center share best practices and processes among the colleges. We've also completed a few yearly reviews of the e-curriculum, and this is to evaluate if and how much cultural competency is embedded directly into the Academic Health Center colleges. We've also promoted many service learning projects, which provide opportunities for our students to participate in order to connect learning objectives with community service. We've also had many opportunities for interprofessional education among all our students so that they will be prepared to actively participate and lead interprofessional teams that deliver care that results in, a, in enhanced patient outcomes. So this is the example of that institutional data dashboard that I mentioned that we developed. Before this dashboard, tracking our enrollment of underrepresented students was cumbersome to say the least, and there was not coordinated efforts to review across the academic health center colleges. And the academic health center colleges I probably did not mention was allied health sciences, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy. So we've defined underrepresented students as individuals who self-report as American, Indian, Alaskan Native, African American, Hispanic Latino, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and those who identify with more than one race. So we've seen a growth from 14% in 2014 to 17% in 2018. As the funding for our team is coming to a close, this work will live and continue under President Pinto's Next Lives Here strategic plan, where urban health is a pathway. They will continue to work with institutional leaders and the community, including our community advisory board, to work in collaboration to improve outcomes and reduce disparities in our community. They will also continue to promote educational pipeline programs to increase diversity of the student body in the AHC colleges and to focus on making sure every student is culturally competent to give the best care possible to all members in our community. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hi, thank Hi. you for your presentation. Um, my name is Jamie Leslie, I'm in the College of Nursing. Uh, so Tammy and I know each other, but um, 
I'm curious about the community advisory board. I hadn't heard of that, and I was curious, like, is there a way for researchers to access that and sort of get feedback from the board on, you know, research studies before they get started, that kind of thing? That has not been a focus in the beginning, but that is a great thought, and I would say uh, Dr. Glazer is going to continue to kind of chair this advisory board, so that's something I'll take to her, and I think that's an excellent thought. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dorian Mundy. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just have a quick question. I noticed throughout your um, presentation, you referred to black and African-American populations as just African-American. Is there a reason why um, there's not a black and African-American slash African-American population? No, there is not. I apologize. No, I yeah. just think it would, so for folks who may be Haitian American, for example, who may not identify as African American, but they identify as black, and society identifies them as black, that, that may be important to include okay. um, with African American. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. All right, so our final, uh, final panelist uh, for this morning, um, we're gonna have a tag team presentation. Just to give you a little bit of background though, um, just a heads up, University of Cincinnati College of Medicine is one of the only US medical schools to have a nationally published dedicated transgender medicine curriculum. And so what we're gonna have now coming up uh, are two speakers that are gonna speak about that. Particularly we have Dr. Pickle, uh, she and her colleagues are studying best practices for training future generations of healthcare professionals in transgender medicine. And we also have Steph Morawski. They are currently completing a qualitative dissertation that explores transgender patient experiences of navigating and managing a stigmatized gender identity in biomedical context. They plan to generate a critical analysis of stigma in healthcare that demonstrates how structural, interpersonal, and individual level transgender healthcare experiences are gendered and ra uh, racialized. So the two of them are going to come up and they are going to speak on the topic of developing best practices to address LGBTQ and health disparities. So thank you. All right. I know everybody's probably getting a little hungry, so we'll try to keep this entertaining and you know lunch is coming next, so that's good. So I'm gonna speak first, uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm gonna be discussing a little bit about our um, transgender medicine curriculum, but really an trying to answer the question, where do we go from here to train that next generation of healthcare providers in culturally competent healthcare? Steph and I have no disclosures. For our first two session objectives, we would like to discuss health disparities in transgender individuals and discuss healthcare professionals' roles in these disparities, and also to talk about the educational strategies to train future physicians. With, um, we'll talk about the study that we just completed at University of Cincinnati to help inform these first two session objectives. And then, as both Reem and Tammy discussed, in order to better understand an LGBTQ plus population, we have to be able to understand the community that we're working with. And Steph is going to talk about some best practices for data collection in these communities. So I know one of my research colleagues is at the back there, Harini Palerna. Um, Dr. Shanna Stryker also um, is the lead for our team. And our study that we just completed is considerations on medical training for gender affirming care, motivators and perspectives. So to give you some context for this conversation, transgender persons self-identify as um, identities that, uh, that span the typical or normal, you know, we don't even want to use those terms, right? We know that gender is a spectrum, and we know that sexuality is a spectrum, and for transgender individuals, their self-identity may cross that spectrum, or they may not connect with the gender they were assigned at birth based on their presumed sex at birth. 
For transgender persons, they, compared to their non-transgender peers, report outcomes um, as far as health disparities, lack of access to care, poorer health outcomes, difficulty finding providers to care for them, and one in three report when they do see a healthcare provider or interface with the healthcare system mistreatment. Most US medical schools do lack a dedicated transgender curriculum that will um, address how to train future physicians in culturally competent healthcare. And although there's core competencies that have been defined as all future physicians and healthcare professionals should be able to do this, there really isn't a consensus on how to integrate that into the curriculum. So the purpose of our study was to identify those motivators and those um, really key recommendations from the experts. So individuals who are healthcare professionals who are practicing gender affirming care across the country, what do they have to say? And this is a population that has never really been asked in this formalized way what their recommendations are. And this was a voluntary cross-sectional survey of healthcare professionals across disciplines across the country. The um, respondents of our survey represented multiple disciplines in medicine, but of the 473 respondents, about a third identified as either physicians, physician assistants, midwives, um, or nurse practitioners. So really those key clinicians who are providing gender affirming care, including hormone treatment, primary care, preventative care, and gender confirming surgeries. When we looked at these individuals and said, what motivated you to be part of the transgender health workforce? They said filling a need in the community and a professional experience were the main two motivators. But others said, this is an uh, expectation of my institution that I provide gender affirming care. Or they may have had a personal experience with either themselves, family, friends who identified across the gender spectrum and they said this is important. We asked them to identify one key recommendation on how we should train the next generation of healthcare providers. And close to 35% said it must be a clinical experience or rotation, followed by 19% saying mentorship. What was interesting is that some of the key training modalities for future physicians, such as residencies or fellowships, were actually not recognized as the most critical time to interface with future physicians as far as allowing them to want to join the gender-affirming workforce. So where do we take this? We know that training the next generation of healthcare providers across the field of medicine and nursing, midwifery, physician assistants is really going to be a multimodal and a multi-step approach, starting with longitudinal experiences during medical school. Not only does that shape a future physician or clinician's ability to provide gender-affirming care in a culturally competent way, but motivates them to want to reach out to future physicians um, in a mentorship role as well. So having sustained mentorship is important. One of the limitations of our study was that the training programs for um, MD, DO, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and midwives are all different. And so future research needs to be done as to the timing of these um, programs within the curriculum. With that, I'm gonna um, hand it over to Steph who's gonna lead the last part of our discussion. Awesome. Hey, so I am Steph Murawski. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I am a PhD candidate uh, in the Department of Sociology here at UC. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about some best practices around language when you're conducting research, either qualitative or quantitative, um, with queer and trans populations. Um, so it's worth noting really quickly uh, that the current alphabet soup of the LGBT moniker keeps getting bigger and bigger. So we're now talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, queer, intersex, and asexual folks. So that's marginalized people um, in terms of sexuality, sex, and gender. So there's a lot going on here. Um, and as researchers, we have to sort of adapt to be able to capture these things in our data. So the things I'm gonna talk to you about really quickly today 
um, are some of those new options and how using things like check all that apply or write in options um, when making questions to ask interviewees or survey respondents um, can address some of these problems. So when thinking about sexuality, uh, we have three components that we're actually asking about potentially. You have identity, which most people conceptualize as uh, your sexual orientation. You have attraction, who you actually like like. Um, and then you have behavior, right? Who you're actually hooking up with uh, or having sex with. Um, so when asking about identification, this is still sort of a straightforward question um, that's sort of a laundry list of terms. You might notice that the example I'm giving you has more options than just gay, straight, or other. Um, so it's sort of like finding a happy medium between listing every possible identity that someone could have um, with uh, these ones. So straight, lesbian, gay, bi, queer, pansexual, meaning you basically like everybody, or asexual, meaning you don't um, have an interest in having sex. Um, and then your uh, catch-all can always be an other box, which if somebody doesn't feel represented there, they can write their own identity in. In terms of behavior, um, these questions would traditionally say things um, for responses such as men only, women only, men and women, um, or no one. So when we're starting to think about more options in terms of identities, such as having non-binary people represented on here, it becomes easier to just use a check all that apply um, type of format, and that can still capture the same data without having a million overwhelming options. Um, the same sort of thing goes for sexual attraction and asking about that. You can simply just have a check all that apply to say that you are either attracted to men, women, non-binary folks, or no one. That would be someone who's aromantic. Um, or letting people select as many or as few of those options as they, they desire. Um, asking about gender is a little bit different. So traditionally, this question probably would have looked um, just like the options man or woman, so that's a binary understanding of gender that we're generally trying to move away from. Uh, and the best way right now to ask about gender is to use a two-step question. Um, and a two-step question is basically a way of asking and looking for trans identities and capturing them even if people don't self-report themselves as trans. Um, so when asking what is your gender identity, this is the first part of the two-step question. Um, so the options you're probably familiar with, man, woman, um, and then adding in trans man, trans woman, or non-binary uh, or genderqueer, and then of course other, because this is probably the question where you, were, you will see people write in all sorts of fascinating things. Um, but then to follow this question up with the second part of the two-step question, which is to ask um, what sex were you assigned at birth? Um, and then giving the options of male, female, female or um, in some places you can get intersex um, on birth records now. So also note in the future as places are allowing and recognizing non-binary and intersex identities, X is going to become an option along with F and M. Um, so probably like 10 or 20 years from now you can worry about that. That's, that's a little um, in the future. But using the second question right picks up someone who maybe answered the first step as man, um, and then if, if that person answered the second question as having been assigned female at birth, even though that person didn't disclose that they had a trans history, um, you would still pick them up as being transgender. So using a two-step question around gender allows you to capture that information that you otherwise might miss. In terms of when and what you ask, um, it's worth thinking about whether you're priming your respondents by asking them about gender or sexuality, uh, especially in qualitative research. Um, and and a, a special consideration around this for those populations is that you're asking them to out themselves to you. Um, and that has a, another added level of discomfort for it for some folks. Um, it could also work in your favor. For instance, when I I'm talking to trans folks about health experiences. I do ask them about their gender identity first in the hopes that they then think more deeply about healthcare with regard to their gender. Um, in terms of how you word your questions, this is basically just a quick tip on being tactful, especially with um, gender nonconforming and trans patients. Um, so maybe it, with regard to sexuality, instead of having a question that asks what is your marital status, um, a better way to ask that question would be to ask 
do you currently have a partner or partners? So that does three things for that person. It shows them you're not assuming everyone is straight. Um, it shows you're not assuming everyone is monogamous and it's also making room for if people are polyamorous or have more than one partner in their family. Um, with regard to gender, an example of a question like that, and this is actually one that I use when I interview folks, is to ask um, trans folks something like, do you receive care for having a prostate or a cervix? So instead of asking a trans man, did you get your uh, yearly well woman checkup, um, you can say that a lot more tactfully, right? Another example of that would be calling this area of your body your chest rather than assuming people want to call this area your breasts, right? Um, so that's just a little bit about how you can ask things. When you think about writing up or reporting your findings, um, it's important to be specific and intentional with your words. So going back to what I said at the very beginning, the LGBTQ moniker at this point is covering a lot of grounds. It's not just talking about gender, it's not just talking about sex, and it's not just talking about sexuality, right? People could have one, many of those identities, um, and they don't all necessarily line up. Uh, so the, the big take home from this is, um, are you talking about sex or are you talking about gender when you write something up? The women's studies person in me, that's why I have my master's degree in, could talk to you for like two weeks straight about whether these terms need to be theoretically separated. But for clinical writing, I would encourage you to use the word sex when you're actually talking about sex assigned at birth. So if someone was male, female, or intersex, if that was their assignment. So think genitals on that one. Um, and then gender, talking about your actual gender identity. Do you identify as a man, a woman, a non-binary person, a gender queer person, et cetera? Um, and sort of keeping those two things separate. So an example of where this might come up, um, thinking about like a table one, or this example that I have for you, the top uh, graph chart thing here is actually from UC's IRB um, supplemental review. So I just had to fill this out because I needed continuing review for my study. So it asks for gender and then gives you the options, females, males, and other, um, with the caveat that other isn't talking about non-binary folks, it's talking about not capturing that data. Um, so as you can see, the bottom chart is what I returned to them, um, where I changed it. I don't know if they appreciated yet. I haven't gotten continuing review approval. Uh, but cis men, cis women, trans women, trans women, and then non-binary folks. Um, so again, I don't, I don't know how doing a study about trans folks I would have even reported uh, sex, and I don't think I would have wanted to. I think that does some sort of discursive violence um, towards especially gender minorities. Um, so that's just an easy and sort of humorous example. Um, and then I'd also encourage people not to be afraid of using the word cisgender in your findings, even if your research has nothing to do with LGBT folks. Uh, you can still describe your population as cisgender if they're all cisgender. So cisgender is not a derogatory term, it just means not trans. Um, so if you don't feel any incongruence between the sex you were assigned at birth and how you identify in terms of gender identity, congratulations, you're cis, um, and that is a word that you can use in your everyday language to help normalize talking about these sorts of things. Um, and then I know not all of us are embedded in research all the time, so these things also translate really easily into everyday clinical practice. So using language, especially with LGBT and gender non-conforming folks, um, that doesn't make normative assumptions about bodies can be a great way to signal that you're an ally in this way. So if you have somebody that looks like me that comes into your office, um, using language like partner instead of uh, other assumptions, right? Uh, and even asking people who you might not know whether they're queer or trans, um, studies have shown that straight and cis people are not offended in any way by being asked those questions. So uh, LGBTQ folks will probably really appreciate things like being asked what are your pronouns. Your cis and straight clients probably will not care and definitely won't be offended. Um, and then Another easy application of this sort of language is to update intake forms um, and electronic medical records to, to reflect these options and the, the diversity of this population. Um, so again, you could use a two-step question about gender on an intake form, um, and it probably will not offend people. So I will just leave this last slide up here um, 
as Dr. Pickle and I answer questions. These are just some further resources if anybody wants them. If you're really interested in the queer methodology side of this, a great book just came out called Other Please Specify, uh, largely written by queer people doing research on queer and trans populations, um, and that's great for looking further into methodologies. These two links um, from the Williams Institute are great places to go if you are gonna conduct especially an aggregate data survey and want to think more deeply about this. And then if you actually had an interest in implementing some of this different language in a clinical setting, that last link there is actually a study that talks about implementing that language with a team in a clinical setting over a 12 month period of time. So Dr. Pickle, if you wanna come back up for oh, a question. I will sit right here. Okay, okay, <laughs> I will go sit down too. Yeah. Thank you. But we do have maybe a few minutes for questions while they're setting food up in the back, so. Thank you for your presentation. It was uh, really informative. So um, in my work, um, we work with health systems and practices in data collection. So race, ethnicity, and language data collection, they're all required to collect it utilizing OMB categories. Um, so they have a lot of information on, on how to do that um, because it follows Census Bureau guidelines. When it comes to LGBTQ plus data collection, there aren't guidelines and there aren't methodologies for data collection. Health systems are required to adopt electronic medical record systems that have the capability to collect LGBTQ plus data but they haven't turned them on yet for the most part. Some have, and a lot of them are talking about it. So my question is related to one, how do you think systems and practices can best prepare to begin asking those questions? And second, many of them are considering collecting the data at the point of registration where they collect race, ethnicity, and language data. So my question with regard to that is, do you think it's a good idea to collect the data at the point of registration or somewhere else in the system? What was question one? I already forgot. Uh, <laughs> so um, I forget my first oh, question. Oh, implementing? <laughs> Implementing. Um, Impl yeah. So this, this last link up here actually gives best practice <laughs> suggestions about doing that, so I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, and a large part of that was training sort of support staff or paraprofessional folks, so yeah. receptionists all the way through nurses, all the way through doctors, right? Um, and also doing things like putting out information in the waiting room that explains why that information is being asked for and what, what that might mean. Um, what was question? And the second, oh, yeah, the second the, question was with regard to that. To I, don't, I honestly don't have any expertise in um, <laughs> as a medical sociologist yet. Um, I can see how, though, from the perspective of folks having to out themselves to a stranger, that doing that with a receptionist might be more nerve-wracking than doing that behind closed doors with a physician. Um, so I think, I don't have an answer for you, I'm sorry, but I think that is worth studying. We, um, there's a, a few different thoughts that, that our practice at UC Health has. We do have patient intake forms that do explain why we're asking questions and also provide the opportunity to say, if you don't feel comfortable answering 
this, that's okay. And then we have our uh, medical assistants who, from a flow standpoint, are the ones who are initially interfacing with patients in the privacy of the exam room, um, able to ask some open-ended questions to allow to capture both gender identity and sexual orientation. But one of the ways that we are training our Co my co-physicians and advanced practitioner colleagues as well as our medical students is um, we need to be prepared not only if we gather that information to, to place it in the medical record in a way that does not out the patient if they don't want to be identified by their gender identity or their sexual orientation but allows for the appropriate provision of health care to be provided so we are teaching our students how to do that too and our myself because sometimes i'm the one placing that data in well, I would love to talk with both of you more about this. I think there's a lot of opportunity for you to inform the field and to establish some best practices, both locally and nationally. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. So when I'm trying to implement uh, some of my research, um, I'm trying to predominantly target uh, demographics, and one area I target is gender. But I'm not trying to specifically look into whether somebody's trans or not. Is it okay to go through more of a simplified form and just educate the user that they should just pick whatever gender that they um, identify with as I'm trying to target based upon gender, or should I actually be more forward about uh, targeting those that are you know, trans persons and then try to build up my work on that particular end for um, uh, uh, linking between different content? I guess it depends maybe on the the scope of what you're doing, are you interested in making a distinction between trans and cis respondents? Uh, no, that's that's the thing. It's more like I'm just trying to directly bluntly target uh, gender for the research that I'm doing. And to me, it's not about specifying whether or not they're cis or trans, but I don't want to kind of build in a tool that... Um, so you're just asking about whether people identify as men or women? Yeah. Okay. So. I mean, I would say do a two-step question because if you still can identify a trans subpopulation, maybe you'll just get an extra research finding out of that, even if that isn't the outset. I do think if you only had the options of man or woman, trans folks would still probably totally um, identify in those ways. You would maybe need to add an option for non-binary or queer folks. Is this quantitative or qualitative? Uh, quantitative. Yeah, so that's harder, right? Because then it's like how many, how far do you push it in terms of how many options there are? Um, but I think if you added a non-binary um, or genderqueer option, you could probably still get away with just doing man, woman, non-binary. Um, and then if you want to figure out whether folks are trans or not, add that second part of the two-step question. Oh, um. So I was wondering, um, at the form level, um, for uh, having people identify as cisgender, um, how you would like explain that on a form, like in a succinct way, that um, a cis person that had never heard of uh, cisgender before um, understand it and like, uh, you know, identify themselves correctly. Great. Um. So usually I just use the idea that whatever a doctor declared you to be at birth, do you agree with that now? Right. <laughs> and if the answer yeah. is yes, then sis. If the answer is no, then you're on the, the trans spectrum. Oh. Um, that's an interesting question, though, because even the way I had it worded up there, I, man or woman sort of implies cis man or woman mm -hmm. when there is a modifier trans before something that sort right. of like feels like it inherently stigmatizes it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, thanks. Um, my question is more about, um, I guess it would be part of a multiple of identifiers, but um, 
you know, sometimes what somebody identifies is a point in time. And how do you address that? Because, you know, you ask somebody, maybe when they're 20, there's uh, a cis woman, and then they're, you know, at their 30, they're a trans man. Uh, you know, and it's, and how do you identify that yeah. in, in, in your research? Well, I, <laughs> you hope for a funder that wants to fund you for a long time. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so if longitudinal data, if you can't do longitudinal data, then I think you just have to go with what folks are saying at a certain point in time. Because as a qualitative researcher, you wonder sometimes if the stories you hear are all 100% true. And you realize, right, that it's not about the inherent truth. It is that that story exists. So that, that data point exists authentically one way or another at that time. But yeah, longitudinal data and, and funds are great. I mean, the same thing is true about longitudinal data and like income. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm Elizabeth Nury with the Institute for Policy Research, um, but this is actually more of an educational question. Um, so as a student, I had been working with the National Transgender uh, Discrimination Survey, and, um, and <laughs> working with the other boxes, people get pretty sassy in there, uh, and they say some kind of bizarre things sometimes, some funny things, and I was just kind of wondering how you... Um, give that trans assignment, like, do you just kind of go, okay, they said male, and then their sex assigned at birth was man, that's cisgender, and then you kind of do, like, cisgender, non, you know, and everything else is trans. Is it, like, is it that simple, or what do you typically do with those cases? Because it gets that's very complicated. That's something I'm dealing with in my, in the study I'm doing right now, because I'm, um, I'm asking people, trans folks, what it's like to go to the doctor, basically, and, and I've broken them down by gender identity to be trans men, trans women, and then the like catch-all of not those things, <laughs> but that includes like five other subset. I have like a gender void person, which isn't something I had heard until last week, gender fluid, gender queer, non-binary, some people who say non-binary isn't trans, right? So for the sake of having to do things like report that to the IRB, I, I do lump people together, but then when I write about it, I can make those distinctions. Um, so I guess if somebody's being snarky, <laughs> then maybe you look at the two-step question. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't get it that they were like necessarily being snarky or just that that didn't but capture people, their people identity. People fill it in with like gender amazing unicorn and like that is something I've seen yes. written down. <laughs> yeah, so that person for you would probably go in, in the non-binary category, maybe. Um, but I think that really highlights how inadequate our languages and our forms are to keep up with how gender has changed, especially in the last 10 years. Um, so I don't have any great answers for you. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I just... cite that survey a lot in my work. Um, do you? Yeah. But yeah, it's just difficult to deal with because I had, I had no yeah. idea what and to do. Somebody with published um, a sub article off that called a gender not listed here about how those folks that identify in different ways on that survey have different health outcomes than binary identified trans folks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. I actually have a question. So uh, before I start, I just want to preface it by saying first, um, thank you to all of the panelists um, for your talks today. It's highlighted a lot of information. Um, I wanted to focus for a bit on the presentation by Dr. Pickle and uh, Steph Morawski in how you guys went about highlighting some of the ignorances that surround dealing with the LGBTQIA population. <laughs> um, you know, and I think it, it, it goes a, a long way in how that education happens and, and how it impacts the future of healthcare. Um, when individuals come to a doctor, they actually are more aware, more knowledgeable, a lot less ignorant about dealing with um, these portions of our population. And so it helps us all to become better informed. And so I guess my question is, number one, um, what's the data look like? If there is any data at this point, how that is impacting healthcare and um, the continuance of healthcare by those in the community uh, that do identify that way. And for a more broader question to the other panelists, when we talk about these things as ignorance, sometimes we phrase it in um, the term privilege. 
Um, and, and we talk about it in a sense that um, we say that those who may not have ever known what it's like to be hungry, uh, those who live in a more affluent neighborhood, those who have more than just a high school diploma, those things that fall under the category of these social determinants of health, which also impact uh, health disparities. So when you think about those things, um, knowing, realizing that you guys aren't necessarily medical professionals, but when you think about those things in context with uh, health inequalities and health disparities, um, how do you think an education um, on that, and is there an education going on in medical schools right now to help to limit maybe some of the microaggressions that may be felt by individuals who come in um, who may be a part of these communities, whether it's just a, an African American, a black American, um, a Hispanic um, American, and, and just individuals who may fall into these categories. How do you think an education on helping people identify maybe some of their biases? Um, and also identifying that these are um, parts of char characteristics that individuals may or may not have as much control over as we may think. So how do you think that an education on that might impact some of these health disparities when it comes to their interactions with their own healthcare professionals um, and then also just with the general public? So that's a long-winded question, but if you guys want to take it away. Yeah, so um, if we look at Ohioans who are transgender or gender non-conforming, we know that one in four have postponed a trip to a medical professional or a healthcare institution because of fear of mistreatment, and then one in three who, who encounter a clinical encounter will be mistreated. So there are microaggressions and then there are macroaggressions. There are real and lived experiences, and cis heteronormative privilege is a real thing. And so when we're talking about educating our healthcare professionals, absolutely addressing implicit bias when it comes to race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation is part of the training that we're providing students. Um, our transgender medicine curriculum really focuses more on gender affirming care. Kind of starting with the language and starting with understanding how preventative care as well as gender affirming care with hormone treatment and um, with PrEP and with gender confirming surgeries and, and reproductive justice and how all of that will be part of the care that future doctors will be providing for patients regardless of the specialty that they go into that um, all individuals are going to need specialized level of care, and that's one of the ways that we are addressing the health disparity. We have a curriculum at um, University of Cincinnati called Physician and Society, which is led by um, two of our medical education colleagues, and that really deep dives into some of the um, social determinants of health and implicit bias. We need to do more. A lot more. Um, we all do at all of our um, College of Nursing, College of Medicine, College of Pharmacy, College of Social Work, we can continue to do more to address the preparedness of our future clinicians to address their own biases as they enter into the encounters. And just to build on that, and this is a shameless plug for sociology, but having well-rounded curriculum that teaches skills like critical thinking that go beyond the interpersonal. Implicit bias is real but I and very worthwhile to think about, but I think it's equally worthwhile to think about things on the structural level um, because while that is half of it, the other half of it is, is things on the structural level, stuff like structural racism, right? That contextualizes almost everything everyone has talked about today, um, but we don't often zoom out uh, to that structural level. Um, so yes, I, I have the privilege of teaching sociology of gender here and interacting with a lot of undergrads that plan on going into medical careers and exposing undergrads um, and medical students to, to things that uh, foster that sort of critical thought about not only gender, gender, race, social inequalities across the board. I think that that is a big part of preparing people um, on top of teaching things like recognizing implicit bias. Um, so I would just add that, um, again, 
as Dr. Pickler said, here in the academic health center colleges, you know, we just have to continually to, um, um, to have conferences and presentations to continually um, educate, you know, our student body, but our current faculty, staff. Um, I think you all in the audience, um, you understand, you get it. So I would just say there are those who don't. And so I think, you know, just continually to have discussions with folks and try to enlighten them when there's differencing of opinions on, on some of these issues. You can't change people, of course, but you can um, give them a different perspective when sometimes they're coming from a very narrow focus on things. So that's what I would add. All right, so we will end uh, this panel session. So let's give all of our panelists a hand. Thank you also to our audience for being uh, attentive and respectful. We appreciate that as well. So as we get ready to end this and transition into lunch, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, first, we are going to ask that individual tables go to the back, and you guys will be alerted when your table is ready, just so there won't be a herd of, of people lined up back there. So I know everyone's hungry, but if we just kind of bide our time a little bit, we'll all get fed. I promise you that there's enough for everybody here. Um, also, as already previously announced, we do have service providers, and so these are individuals that are represented in various offices and organizations here from the University of Cincinnati. The names have already been announced uh, for the most part, and they are here uh, for you to be able to address certain questions, concerns, or issues that you may have surrounding your data or your data needs. And so I ask that during um, even while you're waiting for your table to be called, please come up and talk to some of our service providers. Um, just get some more information. You never know how we can impact what you're doing currently or in the future. So uh, with that being said, I'll go ahead and dismiss you guys for lunch. Just know that if you have signed up for the uh, data for the power session, it's going to be held in BC uh, 400 of TUC, so just across the hall.